It's Friday, September 1st, segment up front and then I have a couple of small show notes uh, first off wait Lando talk yeah I'm still here okay no just for a, <laughs> for a, minute, uh, for a minute I heard a, a hissing sound and I thought your volume had shot through the roof so I just want to make sure we didn't suddenly have an audio issue that's all because the Skype updated right before we started, so I'm always like, uh oh, spaghetti. I was, but anyway. uh, yeah, you, 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 I was drinking water right then. I thought you, you, you were accusing me of nodding off or something like that. No, we no, just no. started. I, I'm I, here. I, well, I heard that noise, and then I was like, oh, no, we're fine, because that noise is at normal volume. I just heard this weird <laughs> spike and a hiss noise, so I was just making sure. Anyway. What a, what a lovely way to begin the show. Hey, hey, as long as everything's working, that's, you know, all I care about is that the things are working the way they're supposed to. All systems go, Michael. So, let's do our show segment. Uh, patreon.com slash ozone nightmare is where you can go to support the show on that platform. If you go to the show homepage, you will see an array of, oh, I suppose you would call them rounded squares on the right side of the page. Each of those will have different links. The one that has the PayPal logo lets you support through PayPal. The one that looks like a little book with a bookmark will take you to Lando's Amazon author page. There's one that looks like a skull that will take you, I believe, to my link tree or my art site, one or the other, but you'll get to the same place one way or another. And there's one more. Isn't there one more? I don't I remember. No there's more. It doesn't matter. The one other thing is the code Libsyn. I have, I think I, I said, I've gotten confirmation it still works. So there is that. Uh, and so ends the shill segment as far as I know. Uh, I got a couple of little funny notes. Uh, I had a different person tell me that they like the clips of the movies now, so that's great. Uh, so I will continue doing that. Nobody has reported annoyance at it, so that's fantastic. I really didn't know how that would go over. Um, in fact, this person makes music and said, oh, if I hear a clip that I like, I'll let you know so you can send it to me. And I'm like, I'm happy to send it to you, no problem. Uh, and what was the other show note? There was something else. Wasn't there something else? Oh, there is a new late night that will be out on... The hold on today is the first, second, third, fourth, the fourth. So Monday, the fourth will be the Dr. Doug episode. So look forward to that. And I think I said this last time, but you can pre-order, which I already have his album, Music for Billionaires, which is an experimental ambient album that is coming out, I think, in a week or two, something like that. So, yeah. And there is the show segment over with. I think that's all I had. Yay. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. I uh, mm. I had one of those weird moments that you had the other day. You know how you watch that movie series, the 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 was it the, the four movies or the trilogy? What was it? Oh yes, the apocalypse the Polish movies. Uh, tetralogy. Three? Yes, 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 yes. All right, three of them, right? Uh, four, 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 four. four, four. Tetralogy. Yeah, I go four. Yeah. So you watch those, and we were talking about how it's it's really great that you know you got to this point in your life, and yet there was still something amazing that you discovered that you were like, holy shit. Yeah, I had yeah. some. I, I had something like that happen recently. I just wanted to bring it up because it's an art thing, and I always like to bring art into into the Ooh, mix. Art things. I love art things. Yeah. So I, so there is an artist named Jean Leon Jerome. Don't look him up yet, right? Because I want you to. I I would I, have to have you spelled anyway, so I can't. I know. I, I mean, I could guess, but I'd right, probably be wrong. Right. So so. 
I want I want you to wait till you look at him up because I want to describe what happened. So I was I I'm always I'm still in the process of kind of building out my 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 artist refuge because most of my life I've always had my gym in my office and now I have this little office above the garage that's kind of my own space. So I've been putting a lot of art on the wall and I've been finding new places to put art on the wall, which means I keep looking for art. Um, and I like to mix things between modern and like more classical art, right? I like because it, it all occupies the space. And I saw this painting by happenstance. It, it popped up linked off of something else that I was looking for. And I was like, what the fuck is that? So now I want you to go into Google and I want to type in uh, truth coming out of her well. Oh, God. I could go so wrong. Truth coming out of her well. Okay. Uh, la verite sortante de plus ami de son martinet pour chatter la yeah. manette yeah. is a 1980. Yeah. Wow. Switch truth is English. Truth coming oh, from the, her well. That's the whole. Yeah. Oh, truth you... coming from the well, armed wow. with her whip to chastise mankind. Okay. Right. Okay. Now look at that wow, painting. She looks very angry. Yes. Right. It's kind of haunting, isn't it? Okay. Uh, so you know what? <laughs> yeah. Actually, what it looks like is that she got kicked in the crotch as she was coming over the well. Okay. So the idea of this, right, uh, yeah. is yeah. the artist the, the the artist who created this is um from the late eighteen hundreds. Wow. Um, he did four paintings this way. Yes, he he did four var- variations, oh, not yeah, this. They all, they look different. No, no, um, but uh, the same idea. And of, the okay. idea is based around a a an aphorism from the philosopher Democritus, which was, "Of truth we know nothing, for truth is in a well." Right. Uh, in reality, we know nothing, for the truth is in an abyss. And then the and then basically the the naked truth is represented by the woman. She's naked. She's vulnerable. Right. I like the um, fact that this painting has its own Wikipedia site just for this painting with a whole bunch oh, of... Oh, yeah. Yeah. So so the guy who painted this, his name is Jean-Léon Jerome. You can, you know, you can see the link there. So if you want to find him. So I saw this painting and I'm like, who is this guy? I was like, I've never seen this before. Wow. And I started down a rabbit hole. This guy, in the time period that he was painting, was one of the most famous artists alive. Right. But yeah. since then, he has basically fallen into, like, Nothingness. people. Not yeah, people just don't really pay attention to his stuff because, it, I, I don't know why honestly, but I realized I have known about this guy my whole life because he also painted the famous painting uh, Pygmalion and Galatea. Do you know that painting where the statue is coming to life and it's and it's uh, it's kissing and it's embracing it and kissing the sculptor. I, but yeah, I think I know the one. So I'm looking up now to see if it's the one I'm thinking yeah, of. Yeah, Pygmalion on. and Galatea, 1890. Uh, hold on. Go ahead. I'm, go on. I'm going oh, yeah, no, to... So, so I, I, that painting was hanging in my house. My parents had it. Well, my mother had it. And I grew up with that painting. Never knew who painted it. And it's like this iconic image in my mind. I've known that since I was a kid. Never knew who this guy was. Right? Then another one of his paintings was used by Michael Moorcock, for the cover of his book. Is it is his book or is it Ellen Moore's book? I think it's Ellen. It's one of those oh, two. Oh, yes. I, I know this painting. Sure. Yes, right. The yeah, reason so, I know it, by the way, is not yeah. for anything except for the two heads on the wall. I I remember seeing those heads in an art class and being like, that is fucking a war. <laughs> so everybody's like, oh, wow, yeah. she's beautiful. Yeah. Look at that. So, I'm like, look at the heads. The heads. Yeah. <laughs> so I can't It was either Moorcock or Moore used one of his paintings for their book about writing. Uh, and I always remember the you. image. Um, and the painting, what is it? The painting is called, uh, uh, was it? Uh, oh, i got to find it now. Either way, it's... Uh, I'm, try- I'm trying to look it up, so keep going. I'm going to find it. Yeah, either way. Yeah, so, so then I was like, oh, you know what? Like, I'm curious about this guy. And yeah, he was this humongously well-known artist in his time period. And yet... I don't know anybody that knows this guy. I think everybody has encountered one of his paintings at some point. Uh, well, I was going to say, else. I would never have been able to tell you his name. But, but yeah. I, I know that painting because of the head. So, I remember the head. Yeah, so I went looking for his art. And, oh, yeah, the, the painting, by the way, that was used is called The Duel After the Masquerade. Mm. That was used by the cover for this book about writing. But I started looking through this guy's paint, his, his art, and his art is amazing. His colors are amazing. He did a lot of Middle Eastern stuff, which is incredible. Yeah. And then I found what may be 
one of the more two actually of the more haunting paintings I have ever seen in my life. Right? Yeah. So type in sale of slaves in Cairo and just write Jerome at the end. Hold on. Let's find it here. I'm just going to look because this page has all of his works. Yeah. So, it's 1871. Slaves. Hold on. Uh, sale, sale of slaves at what? Jerome? In Cairo. In Cairo. Oh, Cairo. Cairo. And the artist's Cairo. last name is Jerome. So G-E-R-O-M-E. It's. It, I. I was utterly haunted by this painting. Oh, I guess I should have put painting. That's why I'm not getting the right links. Oh, I'm just getting, I'm just getting <laughs> yeah. all these. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, you know, references articles. to it. Yeah, and Jer- oh, let me put Jerome because I guess a lot of people have yep. done this. All right, here we go. Hold on, images. Uh, it's, it, you see, it's the woman in front of the. Uh, in front of like a market area. Is this where all the people are there, and it's like a wooden thing? No, no, it's it's there's there's was it, oh, I six got it. women I, I think I got and it. they're sitting in front of like a storefront. Hold on, everybody! I hate when they do this bait uh, and switch you crap. You, you want me to send you a link? Yeah, send it to me because all these things are resolving into articles. Nope, that's fine. I'll send it to you. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of his oh, stuff. I've wait. You uh, found it? Is there? It's the women, and then there's a guy in a window, and one of the women yeah. is new with long. Okay, yes, I've yeah, got yeah, it. yeah. Okay, yeah. So, it to me. yeah, yeah. So most, a lot of his work, by the way, is on Wiki Commons. So if you go to Wiki yeah. Commons and you and you type in Jerome, a lot of his art will come up, and there's very good scans of it. Holy but crap! This... Somebody is selling this on a change purse. This what? Is, a product. What? That's how I found it. Yeah. See, this what? is. Yeah, I'll set here. This. I will, this yeah. is, to me. One of the more depressingly haunting paintings well, I have seen. You can seen. buy it on a zip pouch. Congratulations. Oh you are welcome. But of co- do, are do you s- kidding? Of course. It's it's awful. Well, and there's, I, and yeah, there's, never there's another pouch, one where there, it's a slave in a market and the men are checking her teeth like a horse. Oh, yeah, I just saw that one too. That's, yeah, and, and, it's like, so, and he painted wow. these as, as like a statement. And I, I said like, to my wife, it's like a... It's awful because it is an exceptionally well done painting, right? But I cannot call it beautiful because it is horrifying. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But I, I, I didn't, I wasn't, I didn't know there was still art out there that could do this to me, and I didn't know that this guy was out there. And this guy's been out there yeah. on the periphery of my life the whole time, and I just suddenly discovered all his work, and I was just mesmerized. Yeah. By his stuff, his colors are amazing. Like, and he switches around too. He like he's got a lot of Greek stuff. He did. He's got a lot of yeah, Middle Eastern yeah. stuff. He's got gladiators that are fucking brutal. Um, let me see if I can find you the uh, one that some actually. Some of these where he's got the rugs and the people admiring the rugs. Yes, the rugs yes, gorgeous. incredible, yeah. right? Yeah. There was one that my uh, look oh, up. The prayer one is really good. Yes, prayer in the mosque. Man, uh, I guess. Um... It doesn't yep. have the name. Prayer in now, Cairo, eighteen sixty-five. It's on a roof or something. Now, if you go to, there's a painting he did in, in the eighteen nineties called. Yes, Prayer in the Mosque. I just found that with the arches. Yeah, That's huge. Great. Yeah. Yeah. There's one called Working in Marble, or the Artist Sculpting Tanagra. It's his. He painted himself, basically building a sculpture because he was also a sculptor in his studio. And in the studio, there are references to all his other paintings. Oh, I see him. Yeah, yeah. He trained his yeah. own painting. Oh, there's a head in so, that one, too. Yeah. There's the heads. And look, in the background is the painting of Pygmalia and Galatea. I see it. On, yeah, look at on that. On the wall. But how, cool. like, how meta is that? Yeah, sure. You know, so, yeah, this this guy's work just, like, it baffled me. Like, the color and the, the skill. And I'm just sitting there going, Why? Have I never heard of this guy before? Why is his like? Wow. It's just so. Well, we've talked about you know how many artists there are. There's so many. I know, but he was in his life one of the more like that's you know how we always say like who will be the the big name of tomorrow? Well, right? I, I was just about to say though, but think that about it. In Van Gogh's in your day, you know. No, I know, but in Van Gogh's life, he was nobody, and now he is like this iconic. Well, yeah, painter, but the reverse right? happens all the time. It happens now. Exactly. This guy in his life was humongously popular, like his paintings sold in that time while he was alive for massive amounts of money, and yet today, sure. I hadn't even heard of him. Yeah. And everyone and everyone I've talked to about this guy, they're like, I've never heard of this guy. 
And then I'll show them a painting or two, and they'll be like, oh, I've seen this somewhere. And I'm like, yeah, it's so strange. It's like the reverse of a Van Gogh, somebody who is humongously famous, and they disappeared. And yeah. you're just kind of like, why? Why did this? Well, I mean, it's you know? the, same, the same thing that go, go to an average, I don't know. I'm trying to think. There's probably actors who were huge in the 30s. Like that could walk down a street and command presidents to drop and go. Oh, please! Oh, my yeah. Thing. Well, uh, who's you the know. who's the cow- who's the cowboy who had the really big hat? Oh God! That he get, like Churchill came to the U.S. to meet him. Oh, What's his name? oh God! What is that guy's name? Yeah, yeah. Hold on. Churchill uh, meets cowboy. <laughs> What's because he's gonna hit. He had this massive hat. Uh, wait, wait. Winston Churchill. I just saw it. Yeah, Damn it. it just showed it. How did it, ju- it? It was just there. <laughs> it just had a uh, general. No, it's General Bernard, different guy. Churchill meets Boomer Monkey. Boomer was his name. Boomer Monkey. His name was not Boomer Monkey. All right, I was gonna. Say, well, I don't know. That does sound like a cowboy's name. I mean, I was like, oh there, Churchill, I'm Boomer Monkey, and uh, I run this here rodeo. Churchill meets cowboy. <laughs> Uh, Cowboy <laughs> Kenny Churchill. No, I don't think it's him. What was his name? Yeah, I can't remember his name, but he was like he was huge in his time period. I see. I don't know. I and don't he wore know. and he and he had this giant cowboy hat. Oh, that he you wore. know why? All these things are referring to the the, the uh, Churchill Downs, not Winston Churchill. And I just typed Winston. <laughs> Winston Churchill. Uh, uh, man, Calgary Cowboy. Wait a minute, Calgary Cowboy hat. Hold on, this probably has it. Uh, let me look. Okay, the guy's name, David Gainsborough Robert? No, that's the collector. No. Nope. Hold on. It's got to be in here because this is about this. Bids on his off-white Stetson. Uh, let's see. T- by, uh, before he became British conservative, picture of many hats. The Biltmore Caribou Trail model Stetson. Other famous owners. No, I guess let's it doesn't. See. I don't know. Somebody. Yeah, that's, that's what I mean. We can't even find his name. That's what I'm saying. So who cares? But I think I think I just did. Oh, good. What is it? Did I just find him? Yeah. No. Uh, right. no Billy Cody, Ben Johnson, Audie Murphy. Uh, shit. Yeah. I, I I I can't believe we can't even find oh, his name. Find it. Uh. Yeah. Silent. He did a lot of silent movies. Oh shit. shit. Yeah. I can't believe that we can't even find his name. And that's a great example of yeah how how things just mm-hmm. seem to. Yeah. Because we can't even find this guy's name. And yet this nope. guy, I'm telling you, he was so famous that Winston Churchill came to the U.S. to meet him. I can't find anything. anything. Yeah. Hold on. Maybe I need to go back to the 1930s. I mean, I'm looking. Oh, you know what? Let me try this. Let me go to Winston Churchill's thing and look for Cowboy. Nope. Nothing. Nothing. Calvary story. Winston Churchill. Nope. Uh, I'm gonna keep. I'm gonna keep looking for this as the show goes right. on. You, and, you keep uh, looking. Anyway, and, uh, <laughs> but anyway, on. yeah. So yeah. So I can't. I just couldn't believe I'd never heard of this guy. Like his name had never like just really popped up, and that his art is really amazing. I mean, even if you're not, even if you're not an art nut, just experiencing these as almost like photographs of time. Do you know what I mean? Sure. Um, Oh, the one that made my wife laugh. There's a painting of his called The Christian Martyr's Last Prayer. Did you see that one? I'm looking through. Uh, it's, it's, yes, uh, I see it. It's yep. 1883. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's a painting of a tiger, or not a tiger, a lion in the Colosseum in the, in the foreground. And in the background, there is a group of Christians huddling and praying. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes as yes. they would have <laughs> as they would right because uh yeah and apparently that was this thing like he he apparently he liked to paint moments that were kind of different from other people's so like it was always the moment after or the moment before something rather than the thing itself so like i guess at one point he painted um the uh, the firing the the essentially the execution of like a a leader from the french revolution and rather and apparently this guy was a type of personality that he he was found guilty and he called the he basically he told them when to fire he told the, he call, did the whole fire now to the firing squad right big personality but the way that Jerome paints him it's after he's already been shot and he's laying face down on the ground and there's the bullet holes behind him and there's firing squads walking away and it's like 
he shows you kind of this very cold reality. Like he totally strips the the grandeur of of the series. Like oh, he we went to you know he he decided when he was going to die and just shows you kind of the after effect of it. Um, so yeah, I I have fallen in love with this painter, um, and I wanted to kind of bring him to the table because I. Uh, I think there might be other people out there who really like his shit. I mean, I know that I'm going to see if I can get a few of his works on my wall. Um, although, I got to tell you, my wife was like, are you going to get one of the uh, the ones from the, uh, the the slave market? And I was like, fuck no. And she's like, yeah, but you said they were amazing. And I'm like, I did say they were yeah, amazing. Yeah, but you but don't I can't, want to have I can't, it on your, I can't on your wall. look at that on a regular basis. Yeah, that's horrific. It is, right? Um, he has this one... Oh, he's got this one painting. Um, it's called uh, Jerome. I think it's called The Poet. Uh, is that it? Oh, right, yeah. So if you right, if you go to go to Google and type in The Black Poet 1888 by Jerome. Okay. Right? Yep. I found a really good copy of this, and I printed it out on like an 8.5 by 11 on a, on a metallic uh, photo paper, which, by the way, I've fallen in love with metallic photo paper. Yeah, it's nice. The eyes on this poet are so expressive and so, like, piercing that it's almost hard to look at them. Like, it's one thing when you kind of look at it small, but when you look at them big, like, I have not seen someone do, like, such... I haven't seen eyes like that in a while. You know, no, like it's pretty good. Yeah, it almost it almost crosses the uncanny valley. Yeah, usually eyes are one of the places where you see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's uh, yeah. So I was just really impressed. And I wanted to to bring this guy to the uh, the attention of the uh, of the mob. Uh, and then switch gears completely to oh. something not class. Well, I guess it's classical Star Trek. Um, mm. <laughs> so. And a bit last night was uh, last night was movie night with the family, and there was a bit of, of a kerfuffle because uh, mm-hmm. my daughter wanted to watch the new uh, Haunted Mansion movie, and my son wanted to watch Back to the Future, and Ooh. they had a big, yeah, and they had a big fight about it, and I was like, fine, I was like, it's punishment. Uh, no, 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 no. I, I was just if they can't decide, I pick something completely non sequitur. Ah, uh, got so it. So I was like, nah. fine, we're watching Star Trek Into Darkness. Oh. <laughs> oh man you were father of the year in reverse <laughs> so here's the thing we watched the first Jesus. star trek right and we watched the second one Ugh. right i mean the third uh the, the last one beyond star beyond. trek beyond yeah and i was kind of curious how they were gonna <sighs> handle this one because they don't know khan they don't know wrath of khan they don't know any of this so i was actually in a yeah, weird yeah, way yeah, it was yeah, almost guess, like yeah. Yeah, it was almost like a weird experiment no. for me to watch how they react to it, right? Sure. Um, and also because I haven't seen it in a while, and I was kind of like, am I, am I still gonna, am I still gonna hate it, right? Here you are. <laughs> um, so the first the, thing that popped that up, one great moment doesn't make up for the rest. Well, the one thing that popped up right away in that movie is, why does Starfleet look so Nazi? Like whenever they're out of their um they're they're like normal like ship uniforms god yeah. they are all dressed like nazis oh, they're all these yeah. like dark yeah. uniforms with like the little hats mm-hmm. like i don't know any other star trek movie where starfleet looks quite so yeah i don't i don't know what to tell you on that i don't never and i and, and i don't know if that was an, an attempt to them to say well, we're showing the the way that starfleet is getting more militarized right because the whole idea was this was this was supposed to be uh, Starfleet saying no. Uh, this is yeah. not the direction yeah. we're going. Right. I guess that. I guess that. Yeah. Could be it. That does make some sense, at least. I guess. Yeah. Um. Although Peter Weller's uniform is fucking cool. That's another thing I noticed. I didn't wow. really notice the last time I watched it that the uniform, the, the uniforms on his ship are actually quite neat. But well, I think they his remind. Ship is awesome too. I well, mean, he, well that's the other, one yeah, good his, thing. Yeah. My my my. When that ship. All right. So things. The reason I show this to my Vengeance. kids. Right. When Peter Weller's ship shows up 
in hyperspace and starts firing at the Enterprise. Yeah. <laughs> my son yeah. just about jumped out of his fucking seat. That's, that's my favorite thing in the whole movie. And when the ship gets flung sideways out of hyperspace, yeah, man. my son was like, they're all dead. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right, but that moment where Cumberbatch is like, "My name is Khan," my kids were like, "Okay," and, and? yeah, like, "What's going on?" Congratulations, that's a great name, and yeah, and yeah, um, and I realized there's some things I hadn't thought about before. Simple fixes that would have made this movie better. One one thing that would have made this movie better, and I wanted to bring it to you, but it's part of the reason I'm talking about it, um, mm. is that. The, the whole the whole Wrath of Khan thing is terrible, right? But I did have one thing that I thought about while I'm watching this again. And I thought, man, if they'd done this, it would have made this movie better for me. Which is, yeah. so you know, Spock calls old Spock uh-huh. and says, hey, have you ever heard of Khan? Right? <laughs> and Spock's yeah. like, and Spock in the movie is like, well, you know, I told you I was going to tell you about the, pa- about the future because I don't want to fuck things up and blah, blah, blah. And but. then he's like, but. And then he, does, and he tells him about Khan. Hmm. If Spock, if old Spock had told young Spock, we stopped him and it killed me. And, tell, and told him how he died. That basically he went into the reactor to save the ship and that it killed him. Right? Yeah. yeah. And then young Spock, knowing that it was going to kill him, Still did it all again because he knew that he couldn't let his ship down, right? That would have made that movie so much better for me because instead they did the weird flip and then Kirk has this weird, awkward death sequence, but they bring him back right away. Whereas if Spock had knowingly gone into the reactor, 100% sure he was going to die, but did it anyway. I was like, oh, that would have made this movie a lot better. E- even yeah. if they'd brought him back, right? Sure. Even if they'd done the whole thing with the chasing Cumberbitch down and and having you know the 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 fight on the ships, the, which is my ridiculous. My magic blood. Oh. Yeah, it, it still would have made the movie better than what it was. What is your opinion on that? Uh, would it have made it better than it was? Yes. Does it make it any good? No. No, and but I did have but another yes, weird. Sure, one. sure. There's about there's about there's a million a dozen things, things I know, that I would know. Be, make it a little better, or just <laughs> yeah. if you want to satisfy the question, would yeah. that make it any better? Any is the big yeah. word. Sure, I, know. I could come I know. up with a bunch of things that would make it but here's, any better. But here's the other thing I realized too, watching it, it doesn't feel like a Trek movie. No, because uh, no, like I've been watching a well, lot of. Okay, uh, okay, 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 okay. To us, it doesn't. Now, I don't know what your kids would say. No, no, no. Because, so, so he, you know, yeah, go ahead. I, I love Strange New Worlds. I'm watching a lot of Strange New yeah. Worlds. I'm wor- but I'm watching Picard at the same time, right? Sure. And here's the thing. Boy, boy, what a comparison. My, I know, right? My biggest argument with Picard, honestly, is that mm-hmm. they need to turn the fucking lights on. That's my biggest issue with that show. Uh, yeah. Is that it's so yeah. goddamn dark. Who builds yeah. starships like that? Uh, when did When did everyone go, hey, you know what? This ship, this ship would be cool, but can we turn off all the lights so all it right. could be like really kind of goth in here? I hate that. the 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 Titan is like the darkest fucking ship I've ever seen. the yeah. The fucking Millennium Falcon is better lit than that ship, right? Yeah, true. I hate that. I don't understand why they they have these. They've decided that you know because like Discovery, say what you will about the show, Discovery was very well lit. You could yeah. see what was going on, you know, and Enterprise, like in the show, Enterprise, the the Strange, Strange New Worlds, the Enterprise is beautiful, right? And and in the movies, you know, the the Calvinverse movies, the ship is very well lit. Right. I love that. That said, you know, Strange New Worlds and Enterprise are great shows, and they are both unequivocally Trek. They are different areas yeah. of Trek, but they are definitely. Trek. I just watched the episode where Picard, where um, Spock gets turned into a human. I know there were a lot of people who were irritated with that episode. You know what? That episode is fucking awesome. The backdoor commentary on racism in that episode is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? But then I watch um, was it Into Darkness 
And I'm kind of like, I get the sense that somebody wanted there to be a huge message in this about essentially militarism, right? Because yeah. they bring in Section 30, was it Section 31? Yeah. Section 31. They bring in, yeah, they bring in Section 31. Always and they idea. talk And they talk about like war. And I'm like, okay, it's like all of this are interesting things you could have done with Star Trek, right? And I, lo- and I, I like the Calvin vs. Crew. I, I really enjoy Star Trek Beyond, and I love this first one they did. But there's such a Michael Bay about this movie. Like, it's so Michael Bay. Where, like, you know, it, it's not just that they, they needed to have action. They needed, they wanted, they wanted to turn Star Trek into this, like, over-the-top action sh- movie. You know what I mean? Like there, there are just action beats everywhere. Um, I'm surprised a giant spider didn't show up at some point. It's like that level of absurdity. Uh, and what's weird, and I maybe you won't agree with me, is despite all that, I still like Trek. Like, to be wrong, Into Darkness is probably at the bottom of my list of Star Trek things to watch. But it is still Trek. And I would still choose to watch Into Darkness over a lot of things that aren't Trek because I like the Trek universe, right? I acknowledge that it's not great. And I acknowledge that it is like there's a lot of things you could do better. And yet it is worth watching for those few, like, especially for like my kids who haven't seen it. It's worth watching because now my son has walked away. With Peter Weller's ship somewhere in the back of his head, right? And that's gonna go through his blender and come out the other end. And like, who knows? Maybe one day he'll grow up and he'll write for Star Trek and he'll find a way to take that ship and make a cool version of it, right? Um And I know you're I know you're gonna say something like, Yeah, a few cool moments doesn't make the movie worth it. No, I'm not saying it's a good movie. I've seen it again, it's still a bad movie. But there's cool stuff in that movie. Um, and I do think it's worth watching at least once. Like, I don't feel bad having had my kids watch it. Uh, but, and and especially since I can't show them a classic Trek because classic Trek is too slow for them still. I can't get my kids to watch Wrath of Khan, even though I think Wrath of Khan is the best Star Trek movie. You know? Um, so yeah, I, uh, I just kind of wanted to roll that by you. And kind of get your feelings on that idea that, you know, there still are, you know, it's still worth watching in the canon of Trek. You know, there's people that are like, oh, don't even bother. There's people like, you know, Voy- don't watch Voyager. Voyager is shit. And you're like, it is. But it, but 7 and 9 is a great piece of Picard. And she comes from Voyager. You know, um, Voyager has its good moments. Yeah, yeah I don't agree. Uh, but I'll be more specific okay. than simply saying that. Uh, whereas, whereas with somebody saying skip Voyager, I would disagree with that because Voyager has far more. I, I, I would tell people who let's say, let's take the Voyager example, just as a, to comparison yeah. in the darkness. I would say to people, yeah, don't watch all of Voyager. Find a good curated list of, I don't know, 10 to 15 episodes that because Voyager wisely does not have a. Yeah. Outside of you have to watch the first one, you have to watch the last one. Okay. Because that's how they get Hold- lost. That's how they get back. You have to have that. Hold on. Can I roll yeah. something by you then really quick? Because sure. you just kind of made me think of it. Good. If I edited, right, so that the whole con thing was out of the movie, and and this movie was basically the length of an episode of Star Trek, and all it was was Admiral Weller, because I can't remember his name. Admiral Marcus, that was his name. Admiral Marcus trying to set up a Starfleet ship to start a war that he knew was inevitably coming anyway. Right. And then them basically taking his ship out was the whole, you know, I mean, that what is that half a half hour episode? The, the problem is you can't do away with one of the stupidest things in there that to me torpedoes the whole movie. OK, which is Kirk's magic blood. Oh, An you mean no, not Kirk, so not Kirk. Bad. You mean Con, oh, sorry, Con's um, magic blood? Con's yeah. magic blood. Yeah, because it's yeah, so they bring stupid back. that they erased it when they got to the next movie because it's just gone. Like it, it, nobody ca- they never mentioned it again. Because it's so oh, wait. titanically stupid. Was it? Was were they saying that it was supposed to stain Kirk? I figured that Kirk's body was going to process it out. Is, is was it supposed to stay there? Was that what they implied? Well, they don't that he imply was now, that so he was no now reason. 
that to, he was now Connish. Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, it, why not? How yeah. would you not no. come to that conclusion? Yeah, that's right? possible. Because they, yeah. they never, if I, unless somebody, if hey. there's a specific moment, somebody can yeah. tell us. Maybe somebody yeah, but, knows. But you, but you see what I mean. This idea, like, the biggest well, problem that I think that the Pine Star Trek movies have is that they're that next gen, right? I love the next gen show, but the next gen movies were, a lot of them were weak, right? But I love the show. And, like, I feel almost like if Pine and Zachary Quinto had been allowed to have a show, it would have been a really good Star Trek show. But because you just got three movies, you know. Okay, so yeah. here's I, I just reread because I wanted to make sure that we weren't missing something. Because sure. I know you just watched it, but it could have been a throwaway line or something. Yeah. So, yes, Khan's blood revives him. Khan is still alive in a pod, which means magic yeah, he's blood. Frozen. Yeah, yeah. Is oh, it's still accessible. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know yeah. what? I didn't right. think about that. Yeah. You're right. So, yes, so the thing you, is, you there's no to... death anymore. Death is over. <laughs> because, what, yeah. and, here's, and here's my reasoning. Why yeah. would you not put an IV into him and just slowly take his blood out? Just start building a reservoir because you can remove his blood. It'll keep, you know, it'll replenish itself. Yeah. If you think Section 31 wouldn't decapitate it's him and keep not... his body running... <laughs> I mean, would they not? That's, I'm sorry. You, no, no. You know. That is absolutely true. Section 31 yeah. would absolutely decapitate yeah. him. And so, keep what him on you, tap. so what that movie establishes, I'm sorry to say oh, for anybody who likes no. it, I'm going to ruin it now for you. No, no. Uh, no, you are. that. I, but the thing is, what I'm trying to say to you is, right, because you are 100% right, <laughs> is if you remove the con element of the movie, which I know but you're you saying can't. you can't. But I'm saying if you just remove that yeah. aspect of it, and and we're just talking about the idea of Weller okay. as an okay. admiral who's trying to send the Starfleet to war because he thinks that's what's going to happen anyway. Like, if you just watch that 20 minutes of the movie, it's <laughs> worth watching. <laughs> uh, sh- okay, sure. Yeah, watch 20 minutes of a movie that will have not enough setup and, and big missing chance. No, no, but it's, a, it's, it's an astoundingly, like, just that image of... Well, the the yes, vengeance okay. coming in through yeah, but that's that. Yeah, I'm not is not enough I'm not to making, say watch. I'm not you know, making the argument that it's a good movie. I'm just saying that I don't think you should not see it yeah, altogether. Because the subtitle should be of that movie, the Kelvin Terran Empire, because that's what you've just established is the Terran Empire. Because of now that you have magic blood, yeah, a fourth the, movie. Hold on, a fourth movie. They should have a fourth movie. Where basically Kirk and Spock find out that they have decapitated Khan, and they've basically made a super blood supply, and they opt to destroy it. Well, Wouldn't yeah, that be because, great? I mean, why? why no, why you're right. You? That, that, absolutely, you are. Yes, because the thing is, at the end of Wrath of Khan, Khan and all his people are destroyed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but dead. here's actually. But here's. But hold on. But here's yeah. a question then. Sure. Because in the also, by the way, in the original, no magic blood. But go on. No, you, and that's what and that's what I was going to say. Khan didn't have magic blood in the in the in the normal universe, right? I don't remember Wasn't there it, being any mention. He was in genetically, the episode or yeah, he the was movie. genetically superior, but he was genetically superior. It wasn't like Correct. it was something that could be, um, because in Strange New Worlds, one of their uh, people is a Khan, and she is genetically manipulated, but she doesn't have magic blood. Yeah, I'm reading right here just to make sure. No, he is basically Captain America. He is at the height. <laughs> no, he is. He is at the maximum. Oh of no, no, human oh, you're potential. talking about you're talking about Khan in the in the, in the classic. The, the, the classic Khan. The classic. Okay, he's Khan. Captain America. That makes yeah, total sense. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. He's Captain America. Yeah. The new Khan is Jesus. <laughs> I mean, he is. I'm sorry, but it's it's Khan Noonien Jesus. That's yeah. what he is. Right. I mean, yeah, and my yeah, and my wife is saying to me, she's like, you know what? She's like, oh, if they if it they just made it not con, she's like, this would have been a better movie for her. Yeah. She's not, she's not a big Trekkie, um, so she was like, if it wasn't con, she would like because she likes Wrath of Khan as well as a movie. So she's like, yeah, if it wasn't con, this would be better. Like you could have done yeah. all this, and I wouldn't give yeah. a shit, and just have it be somebody else, just no. have it be George, yeah. George, no. yeah, and George as has it is a now, yeah. You have now created a movie called Jesus Con Super Boom because that's what the movie is. <laughs> You have a Christ-like <laughs> enemy and a bunch of explosions. That's what the movie is. So Yeah, and the thing is, his whole crew is like him. 
as well. They're right. Like so that's they the all other have thing. They're super blood. All it's a, it's a it was a team of Captain Americas. And that's or, and or that, sorry, they're even. Well, what comes? What's what is a good power equivalent? What's above Captain America? Uh, the Hulk. Thor? Are they like Thor level? No, it'd be the Hulk. Because Asgardians the Hulk saved. Uh, I mean, no, Asgardians are gods. I mean, they can summon supernatural powers. The Hulk is, you know, the Hulk, and his blood is magic because his so blood. So super Hulk. So they're all super people. Hulks, essentially. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's yeah, no, so there no one-to-one equivalent, I guess. Maybe no, but, no and, but. And, and that's the thing is that there is so much Abrams writing in these movies. There's so much like kind of sloppy. Well, we don't really need to think about it in the long run. But you're right. I mean, like I, I hadn't thought about it, which is my own shortcomings. The fact that yeah, you're right. You're implying that Section Thirty One isn't going to sneak into the cold storage and grab any of the bodies. Then you have to grab Khan, yeah. right? I mean, now, now they do make the implication. Well, they are only able to wake up one of us, right? But it's like that's like right. But they still woke one of you up. Yeah. Well. So and, and that's today. That's not. Yeah. Tomorrow. I was like, so they're they. You're right. They will find a way, and they'll get themselves yeah. a, a a bunch of Captain Americas. Or or even right? if you want to try to keep it as, I don't know, as as surface level non villainous as possible. Yeah. The fact that Khan's blood can do this means they will re-engineer more people. They will find some dedicated, super patriotic yeah, the, Federation yeah, the soldier counter, who will say, I will be a blood donor for the planet. Make me con. And he'll just yeah, be and stuck on a counter, cross with his arms out and IVs coming off him. Yeah, and the counter argument is they'll say, well, you know, the, the whole point is that Starfleet's better than this. And you're like, yes. Yeah, yeah, but the thing is. No, once, it isn't. Once you, create, it. once you create Section 31, right, which – Makes no, sense. No, I mean, you don't even you don't even yeah. need Section Thirty One. The idea that the Federation is better than that assumes that every human being in the Federation is created as an equally good person, which of course they're not. They're human. No, beings. because they find people all over the place who are doing right. bad things in the universe. All you yeah. need is ten people getting together, yeah. going, you know what? I don't like this goody goody utopia. It's boring. I want to live forever <laughs> and cause chaos. I want to be Lobo. So let's just go be Lobos together. And they go and they get yeah. the blood. Because, I mean, come on. It's just nonsense. That, but that's what I'm saying is yeah. you can't save that movie. Whereas with Voyager, as their comparison point, you can save that series by simply cutting all the bad episodes out and finding the ones, the 10 to 15, that are excellent episodes. I know, but but this is the and thing. If if the Calvinverse, instead of making a movie, it had been like three seasons of a show, right? Whereas in each movie yeah. would be like a show. Sure. Right, season two would be the con season. There would still be a few episodes of that season that you would want to watch. Like, you know, uh, you know, if if the uh, fight with with Weller's I ship guess. had been a whole had been a whole episode. Yeah, we'll say, I, right? I suppose if you if you were putting it that way, but it's not that way, so we really can't it's, phrase it I that know, way. I know it's not that way. I just I'm just, I, I mean, just don't think I don't think you should I skip think, it. I think Trek did that. I think Trek has I don't done think that. You story. should skip it entirely. I still think people should see it. Just to see and take away the cool aspects of it that they that I, are there, while also accepting the fact that it is a bad Star Trek movie. I will say without any hesitation, it is the worst Star Trek film that exists. Oh, it, it is by far the worst. The worst. Be- the oh worst. yes, I would watch I'm, any I'm, other Star Trek film. Before. I'm rolling. Huh? Well, I'm I, rolling through my Rolodex. Even because okay. people be like, "Wait, you're saying Final Frontier is better?" Yes. Well, fuck you. It's all the classic Star Trek movies are worth watching. Well, I agree, for but one a lot reason, of people think... No, no, think for one God reason or another. Terrible. Yeah, they're all worth watching. Yeah. I love that crew. I don't and care. And the next-gen ones are, too. I mean, none of the next-gen ones are as bad See, I'm, as this. I am, I am I'm, I'm iffy about the next-gen ones. Well, okay, so let's go no, no, the Hold on, ones, let's be clear, though. I'm iffy about them. I don't acknowledge that they're bad, whereas the I closest, acknowledge that Into the, Darkness is bad. The closest to Into Darkness is Nemesis. Yeah. Right, ooh, Nemesis ooh. is pretty bad. Yeah, however, close. however, yeah. Nemesis still doesn't at any point do something that is so fundamentally destroying of 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 common sense in terms of magic blood. For all the problems you can level at Nemesis, and you can level a lot, mostly that it's boring. <laughs> Let's be honest. Yes. Mostly that. Yeah, it's but just you know boring. what? But what Nemesis has that actually, what Next Gen had, right? Um. Now that Nemesis is directed by Frakes, right? I 
don't remember. Is that one of his? Uh, I don't I, or was I know he the he producer? Did, I know he did uh I know he did First Contact, which is largely regarded as well, No, he so, did not direct that. Right, so Stuart the Bayer. thing about the the thing about this, so. the the next gen movies I found was that they were still trying to create stories within the larger context of the star of that Star Trek universe, right? So, if anybody, if they had done something really radical, somebody would have been like, "Okay, listen, dude, we can't have this because you know the, the, we can't we can't have this in the next gen universe. It makes no sense." Whereas yeah. with the Calvin verse, it was being done by very much. I mean. It's being done by very non-Star Trek people. The biggest sure. fighter for Star Trek in that movie was Simon Pegg. Because didn't he partially write the third one? I think he entirely wrote the third one. That's what I'm saying. Like, yeah. Simon Pegg is a, it was a huge Star Trek fan. And, well, and, 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 and his response... Much, much better movie than it is Darkness a is. Without even way, yeah, it is a way debate. better movie. Yeah. Yes. Um, but, that, but that's what I'm saying is... So, you, so you're saying you're, skip it. You're saying skip it entirely. Uh, look, everybody is free to do whatever they want. Now, no, no, I know, but I'm saying in if your it's me, curated the two Star Trek movies, I never watch when yeah. I rewatch are Nemesis and Into Darkness. I never watch those. Never. I, I will. I, I literally, when I bought the set of the next gen movies, I so threw you Nemesis would tell away. you would tell people not to watch Nemesis is the one with Tom Hardy, right? Yeah, that's the one with that's the last <laughs> one where, where Data dies and you know, but even that one still feels like yeah. next gen. It's just boring next gen. And insurrection yeah. is largely the same. Insurrection is pretty boring because they just redid one of their own episodes. So it's very familiar and it's boring. They redid an episode. Yeah. And that's the biggest complaint that's leveled at the next gen movies is they were too much like the show because they seem too small scale. Yeah. Except and for the first problem, contact. And the problem with the Kelvinverse movies is like Especially, you know, the first one was them trying to just get people interested, and I li and the time travel thing is really interesting. I well, do that and that. that's by the way why Into Darkness is that way is because they interpreted the success of Star Trek 09 as oh people want a Michael Bay version of Star Trek, they want it all action, and so they pumped it all the way up. As yeah, opposed it's too to much. understanding it's that too much, the, yeah, yeah, 09 has a nice blend. I still like 09 a lot. Yeah. Beyond. It's fine. I watch that occasionally, but that's like every five years. I'm like, oh, let me rewatch this. That's it. But more yeah, the thing a, is, you know, but was, I'll, t I'll tell you what's really weird for me now is that when I first started watching Discovery and Spock showed up, I was like, ah, I'm not too sure about this Spock. And now I've spent more time with with the uh, the oh his than Quinto, yeah, yeah than Quinto. So sure. when Quinto pops up, I'm like, eh, Quinto's okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, they're both good. They're both good. At, no, no, they're, they're all good. good. They're all good. But watching the episode when Spock becomes human is like such an interesting character study. Oh, yeah. That's great. You know, about what, you know. <laughs> yeah. Like, so in answer to your question, uh, I would tell people to skip Nemesis and Into Darkness. I really don't. I don't feel that there so is. Even, even people who've never seen them. You yeah, skip them. Don't see them. Because I, I don't feel don't like. Don't even okay, sully your mind. Into Darkness is what? Two hours? Isn't that like two hours long? It is like, it is like two hours long. Yeah. Okay. So in yeah. that two hours. Yeah. You're getting. As you said, twenty minutes of Trek. I'm sorry, it's a hundred and thirty-two minutes. Yeah, I don't know. Even if it's, I okay. I don't know if it's just twenty minutes. There's a lot of interesting little moments. I, I don't know that movies, it's even but, twenty minutes. But I'll go there's, a bit but further. There is I don't a know that's even twenty minutes of total time. But there is but, a lot of other shit in there. Yeah. Yeah, but the thing they is, they kill like I said, Pike. They get rid of Weller, and then you know what's funny is that they they implied that uh, Marcus was going to become part of the team. That she was like going to be part of the ship, and they dropped her right away. Well, but the, and therein lies yeah. another thing: is even the people running this franchise were like, "Yeah, it. this wasn't our best movie." <laughs> right. So, I mean, if you're not even willing to bring yeah. up your failures and yeah. try to defend them, then why should anybody watch them? Because again, but I will still watch another movie from the Calvinverse. Uh, Beyond was good. I enjoyed Beyond. No, and when I, I heard that Tarantino might make a Star is, Trek movie, yeah, I I was thrilled about that idea. I'd love I to would, see. What, I would. I have no problem with the Kelvin verse. I think Beyond yes, because, is a fine because, film. Yes, but I I want Tarantino to fuck with the Kelvin verse because well, sure, there's but, no there's no strings attached to that universe. You know what I mean? I, you can I, do I, whatever you want. Yeah, I put Star Trek 09 is probably number six or seven out of all the movies for me. It's it's fairly far up there because I think it's 
I think when it split off, it was such a wonderful way. I've said this many times. It was a great way to kind of put aside any criticism of, of oh, you've destroyed the No, no, no. Different characters. And I think it's it's perfectly fine as what it's trying to be. And I think it's a perfectly entertaining Star Trek film. It feels like Trek. The characters are fine. The villain is fine. If You know, they have old Spock, so it's got its connection. Like, all this stuff works. Yep. Yeah, yeah. You know? So, I don't have any issue with the Kelvinverse. I have an issue with Into Darkness. I have an issue with Beyond, either. Beyond, I don't know, Beyond doesn't really last for me, but it's nothing wrong with it. It's just kind of disposable. But you could say the same thing about Insurrection, and certainly never. Well, the, inter- the interesting thing about Beyond is that it they... So, in the second movie... Like so, in, into darkness is the whole thing about how uh, basically that Kirk is too, uh, Kirk is too to see the pants and Spock is too by the book, right? That's yeah, like yeah. the whole thing yeah. behind it, the cl- right? Yeah, classic thing. Yeah, and then in Beyond, they're both thinking about leaving. Kirk is yeah. basically bored, and Spock right. feels like he should leave because old Spock died. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. So there's a whole kind of different message there. Like you never really get to them in their prime in deep space. You know what I mean? Um, yes, and I think that's and what I, I and want. I'm okay with that. I, I, well, okay, yes. Well, I wouldn't have minded, thing, I, but like, I don't mind I would, I would enjoy another movie where they're older and, they've, and, they're, and we've gotten through the whole, you know, will they become the crew? Will they not become the crew? And the, it will be different because the actor who played Chekhov is dead and they said that they wouldn't replace him. So you're going to get a different crew. And there's going to be a different dynamic. So I would watch another one. I'm kind of sad that they don't because Chris Pine is pretty good. You know, and uh, I, I uh, look out of the three movies, two out of the three of them, I think, are very watchable to good. Therefore, I would watch another one because that's a plus 50 yeah. percent ratio. Fine with that. What's the, so Frontier, New Frontier, that's, that's the one that, uh, that everybody hates, right? Which one's that? Which one? I can't remember now. Cy- the one with Cybok is Undiscovered Oh, Final Country. Frontier. That's five. Final, That's yeah, five. Final Frontier. And then Final no, Frontier Undiscovered is... Country is regarded as a wonderful ending. I know. But, but Cybok is Final Frontier, five. Yeah. And my and my thing there is... Yes, so people there... don't... People, wait, hold on. So people don't like Cybok? No, no, it's not Cybok. The, the movie is not well made. It's not. Because okay. they basically... Um, uh, from everything I've seen and read, it's sort of not a very surprising story. It's a combination of... Shatner got too far up his own ass. Plus, to yeah. be fair to him, they pulled half his budget. And so he wanted a grand ending with all kinds of, you know, the, the movie's actual framework is perfectly good. It's great. Star, I, I did a five where I argued five is one of the best Star Trek episodes that didn't get that made got made into a poor movie. That if this had been a two part show it would have been far better than trying to make a movie because the idea of going to, you know, the, the cyborg wanting to find God. And I think they're going to try to do something with him. It seems like in. Oh Strange yeah. Worlds, yeah. Which, because they you are. Know what? Uh... Honestly, I tell him do the same story, but do it better. Don't even bother trying to make it different. Do the whole thing where he's trying to find God again. Cause I think that's such a great concept. And the thing where Kirk realizes what it is. And then, you know, it, like that, the thing that the, the because you're talking about, okay, it's worth it. It's worth watching Into Darkness for these moments, right? Yeah, because, it, yeah, you and I you and I differ in this respect. Because the thing is, I, am a, I collect moments. Because when I write or when I produce art, sure. I'm calling on moments. I'm not calling yes. on arcs. I'm calling on yes. the moments. So there's a lot of stuff I see. The same way you watch a bad movie and you're like, you know what? I was like, this movie could be good if they did this, that, and then you see these things that could have elevated the movie. I watch a movie like into darkness and i say okay this is not a good movie i was like but there's a few things in here that i actually really enjoy and i'm going to keep those with me you know like yeah it's just things like that it's it's um oh god it's attack of the clones right attack of the clones is not a great movie but man when uh when jango fett drops that fucking uh sound bomb no it's not worth watching the whole movie for that but it's still fucking awesome and it stays with you. It stayed with us so much that they did it again in in the uh, in the Mandalorian. <laughs> you know, and it's like, yeah, there's there are these cool things. And if you're like me, where you're kind of like a cool moment collector, because it all kind of gets in the blender. Um, for me, it's like, yeah, a movie like that is worth watching 
because I, I take those moments with me. So sure, for I, somebody like you, it's worth watching. But most people are not like you or me. And so I don't think there's enough in Into Darkness for, for most you. people. Yeah. For most people. Yeah. Because I, I, I love the vengeance part. But what I but I literally will not watch the rest of the movie. I just skip to the vengeance part. Yeah. And yeah. like I said, the Peter Weller thing, yeah, it, it's it's fine, but it's a story I'm pretty sure Trek's done at least once before. So I would find out what that episode is. I'm sorry I don't remember. And I would I mean that's that's uh I think that's the conspiracy angle from Next Gen, and then I think they did it again in I want to say Enterprise, where they did this idea well, they, of they, you know, they said they were going to do a Section Thirty One show. Well, there's, I mean, there's, now it's a movie because it's Michelle Yao, but whatever. Yeah, but but oh, what I'm saying is, they switched it to a movie. Yeah, I think because they <sighs> know now they can't afford her for a series anymore, which is fine because now which she's an funny. Oscar. You know, she's in an Oscar. No, movie, I, so yeah, I and, and I, I said to my wife, I was like, oh, she won an Oscar. There goes the show. Um, yeah, that, that's I a movie. I want a Section Thirty One show. I don't. I, I don't. Well, here's my angle. I don't right? think they can do it well. I don't think I don't know if they could do it well either. I yeah. like the idea of trying to the way I would do a section thirty one show is I would basically have it so that the person who is the lead is somebody who's sitting there going, "This is not a good organization, but I am trying to do good things with it," yeah. and and paint because it's kind of like watching a, um, it's very much watching an espionage show, right? I so like we just like watched the one has to be a part of a show, not the show, I just not don't the think show it itself. Works. Yeah. Was it? Uh, I mean, I don't Tom, know, but maybe. Uh, Tom Clancy. The uh, Jack- I mean, no, it's Sandbaggers. It's a Sandbaggers show. Yes, yes. Burnside but like, just... is doing terrible things in in what he thinks is a good service and trying to make the best of a bad yeah. situation. Well, oh God, what's the name of that show? It's the Tom Clancy show with uh, Jack Ryan. Jack Ryan. Oh, yeah. My, sure. my brain kept going, Jack Burton. Jack Burton. It's not Jack Burton. Jack Ryan. It's not Jack Burton. So, so the Jack Ryan show. My wife loves that show. She loves spy shows. We watched that. And, like, it's interesting because it's a big espionage show, right? And to some degree, like Picard flirted with that because all the stuff with Worf, Worf is basically like a, a you know, a, an intelligence operative, right? Sure. Uh, and he's going around and he's look, you know, he's trying to figure out, uh, you know, who's running guns and who who's got these weaponry, who stole this, and, who's, and like I would watch a whole show about Worf as the head of an espionage project, right? Um. Actually, I would watch a show where Worf has to liaise with Section Thirty One on a uh, on a big, like, you know, intelligence situation because it would be really interesting to see Section Thirty One go up against old Worf because they went up against him. I think went up against him, but they but he dealt with them in Deep Space Nine. But like, it's a different Worf there. Like, Picard Worf is uh, not mature. He's more dangerous. <laughs> um, but either way, the idea for me, a Section 31 show, when I think of the whole Jack Ryan show, I was like, I could see it, this idea that Section 31 is like the CIA. And the whole idea is like, yeah, you have a a department that can very easily go south. But there's an argument that it's necessary in the background because some things there are some things Starfleet can't do. And it's all about making the right argument. Like, it can't be this dark and gritty trek. It's more so the idea of, you know, it's it's Michelle Yao showing up and taking the guy and the baby from the Klingon emperor, empress. And then basically them manufacturing a dead body and a, and a, and a dead head. Which, honestly... Did they just give her a dead body, like a dead baby? Because the other thing is, the Empress throws the dead baby and the decapitated head into the like the the, the chasm, right? Did they just give her a dummy, or do they actually just give her a dead baby? Because this is, um, this is Section Thirty One, and can you use the replicators on the ship to make a a dead body? I I don't know. I mean, I, I assume you can. Right? No, actually, there's probably not, some kind it's not, of there's it's probably not alive, something. right? No, there's probably something that prevents you from making anything that can be considered a. Jesus, organic, could you be? You know. a, I was gonna say, well, could you be a cannibal on a Starfleet ship? No, I don't think you can. Just be like, I just use the replicator to make dead bodies and eat Maybe, them. You know, it's like synth meat, I guess. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. Like, you know, you're yeah. just changing the shape yeah. of it. So, yeah. 
it's just you know what i'm gonna use the phrase you use it's just a glamour it is yeah right so, so um sure. but uh but yes yeah, so but starfleet wouldn't do that section 31 would do that and i was like when i saw michelle yao and the way she handled things i was like okay i was like i understand what you're trying to do here and the argument you're trying to make but like yes you are correct it's a very slippery slope and if you don't have extremely deaf writers doing it it can fall apart quickly but I also don't want a whole show of Michelle Yao because I don't find her character to be as um, endearing as other people do. That's, that's, yeah. that's why I'm not looking forward to it. I like her as part of a crew. But the problem is she won an well, Oscar. Th- that's so now the she's Section the lead. 31 problem yeah. blown up. It's, I don't think it works. I, I just, I don't, I don't think we're ever going to even get the movie. A lot of people have said that. I you don't think- agree. I think it's just going to, it's just going to get canceled. See, I would love a crew. I would love a a Section Thirty One show about a crew of lovable bastards. I think at this point, what they have seen is that people are not responding to the dark side of Trek very well. They're ending Discovery, uh, the last season of Picard, which was the more kind of throwback and happier one, is the one people like. Yes, Strange yeah. New Worlds has taken off. Lower Decks it's has huge, taken yeah. off. That's the fun yeah, side. man. I never would have thought that Lower Decks would take off so it's well. It's a fun show. It's a fun show. It's very fun, and the yeah, fact so, they did a crossover like uh, that, and it worked very well, utterly baffles me. <laughs> yep. But that's what I'm saying is I think the message has gotten across that people don't want any more of that. They don't want more Star Trek into darkness. They literally don't want that. They want the fun adventure trek for a while now. Yeah, and that's what post pandemic and, yeah. and everything else. People are like, I'm sick of it. Just get like jettison well, we're, this yeah, shit. Yeah, this is the whole uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Gun is taking over DC. Gun doesn't right. want to do yeah. gritty. Because here's the thing. Listen, Guardians Three is it has has very dark elements in it, but I don't consider it to be a dark movie because the overall message of that movie is about enduring and moving on with your life and having hope. Right. Like I after watching Guardians three, I have a lot more. I have a lot more hope for what he may do with DC if they let him. Do you know what I mean? Like now, granted, I never saw his version of um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, I almost called them the Glorious Bastards. <laughs> what the fuck? Oh, the Suicide was, Squad? The su- yeah, I never saw his oh, Suicide Squad. I like that. Squad. I thought it was good. Right. But like. It's Having funny. seen Guardians three, I'm like, you know what? I want to see what James Gunn does with DC World because you know it's okay to do things that are a little dark, but as long as you can maintain a sense of, yeah, you know, fun. I mean, like yeah. Guardians still had a ton of fun to it. There's a psychic dog that kicks ass in that movie. You know what I mean? Like, well, it's like you said, we'll see what he's allowed to do. Saying you're running well, uh, something yeah. doesn't mean you're yeah. running something. So we'll, well yeah, because you know, I was, um, so I encountered a strange bit of information that i didn't have before and this won't really be a big thing for you but it's more so the discussion of how money and politics can kind of affect the show so i didn't know that joss whedon hated the character who plays spike on buffy right so that actor who um who then went on to be uh was it harkness's boyfriend in torchwood <laughs> which is like probably one of his greatest roles because they did they, they did the whole adam ant thing with him but anyway so I didn't know that Joss Whedon hated that character, which was very popular. And that the studio basically said, no, people are responding. Keep him in the show. And Joss Whedon was a huge asshole to him, right? Uh, but people liked the character. So the studio was like, we want more Spike. So when the show ended, they killed Spike, right? That's one of the things that happened at the end of the show uh, of Buffy. Angel was still going. And apparently... The, at the end of season four, season four was coming to an end, and they told Joss Whedon, hey, we're canceling Angel. And Whedon was apparently like, shit, is there anything I can do to that would get you guys to give me another season? And they were like, nah, not really. And he was like, what if I bring Spike back? And they were like, really? And he was like, yeah, yeah. And apparently they, they let him have a fifth season because he agreed to bring the character of Spike back. But they didn't give him more money. So the whole idea was that he then had to rearrange his budget to budget for this named actor to be in the show. 
Um, and in doing so, he was forced to remove... Uh, there was an actress who'd been part of the show. She was part of the show for the first three seasons. She was part of Buffy, and then she got written out because I think there was something in there, but she got pregnant, and Joss Whedon told her... Joss Whedon was like, don't get pregnant! She got pregnant, so he wrote her... He turned her into the villain. I told you not to be season. a fatty! Get out! <laughs> yes, yes, uh, yeah. Well, the, the more you find out about Joss Whedon and his, yeah, and his it's aggressiveness... Not it's not great. Um, but the fact that that basically they brought Spike back, which I thought was quite funny. I mean, like the, the character has good um, comic timing. They brought him back, and they f- were forced to not bring the other woman back, which changed the entire like dire- direct like uh, direction of the of the of the season. And it kind of like it's so fascinating how it's these outer dimensional elements that then change the course of the story. You know, where you're sitting there going, "Well, why didn't they do this?" And you're like, "Cause they didn't have the money." They didn't have the money. The actor didn't want to come back. You know, it's like it, it, it's it's amusing. It's like why didn't why has Eccleston never been on any of the uh, the multiple Doctor Who shows? I mean, when they did the the one with uh, John Hurt, John Hurt was supposed to be Eccleston. Well, that, that was supposed was because to be Eccleston said, "I'm not coming back." Period. Fuck you, exactly right. Yeah. So it's so fascinating to me. You know, we're just saying here with Gunn, it's like it'll be interesting to see what the studio lets him do. Sure. It's always so fascinating. How it's like you've got the art, and then you've got the money, and the politics, and oh, the oh, yeah. and the business aspect, yeah. and and how it filters out the art. And sometimes we get stuff that's better, and sometimes we just get shit. Yeah, you know, uh, this, that same system will give you, you know, Strange New Worlds, which is an incredible trek, and that same system will give you Into Darkness. You know, yeah. so it's uh, yeah, yeah it, it's it is, it's sometimes it's as fascinating to read about how a show was oh made sure of course as to watch yeah. a show which i didn't yeah. used to feel that way yeah you know yeah. um but uh yeah. anyway uh yeah that's me that's all i got for you <laughs> well here's something interesting i i watched two movies one is going to be a much shorter review than the other because the funny part about the first movie i'm going to talk about is I already reviewed it eight years ago, but I checked. And as far as I can tell, we never talked about it in review form in the show because I, from listening to that five that I did in 2015, yeah, I had said that I had been sick and I had watched a whole bunch of movies and I listened to the shows immediately after. And I mean, one of them, we were getting into some existential thing about how you can be a person or not. It was, I, didn't, I, didn't, I couldn't even follow what the hell we were talking about at one point. But anyway, that's, <laughs> that's not atypical. But <laughs> I, I honestly, I, I, well, I mean, I was also skimming through. I didn't listen to the whole no, thing. No. I'm like, what no, the no. hell the, are we saying? The, the, but, the fact that the the fact that the the weird uh, yeah, the, it was it was a hell of a thing. It got so weird that it, and, that, and the show that notes, you yeah. went back in time and you and w- listened to it and were like. This doesn't make yeah, any sense. What the hell yeah. are you talking I mean, about? It, was, it, it had to do with Iron Man somehow. I don't remember. It was some weird thing. In any Ooh. event. Uh, but I never saw the movie come up in the show notes, so I have a feeling we never talked about it. And probably some of that is because when I watched it, and I said this in the five, I was watching a bad copy of it. Uh, but because I, I started rewatching this movie because I got a nice uh, new Blu-ray of it. And I was watching it again. And I'm like, yeah, man, I, I think I've watched this movie, but not in this beautiful of a version. And the movie I'm talking about is called Liquid Sky from 1983. Now, I've mentioned the movie a bunch of times, but I'm pretty sure. I'm sorry, 1982 or 3? I thought it said 3. 82. Okay, yeah, it says 82. All right, so 82. Oh. Oh, because I think they, yeah. This looks. It was the most successful independent film of 1983. That's why I was getting it mixed up. Okay. It, It was the most what? Successful independent film of 1983. Really? Yes, which is psychotic when you watch it. Uh, that that that. But I mean, uh, you know what? It's so '80s that it makes sense. Uh, I mean, it is, it is the very definition of art house pretension, mixed with the most '80s looking everything possible. I mean, top to bottom. If you hate the '80s, your eyes will fall out of your head five minutes into the movie. So don't even bother. I well, mean, the it's, blonde it's, the the blonde woman looks like a gozer skunk. Well, here's what's funny. Yeah, I, I had 
I watched the movie before I listened to the five because I didn't want to taint yeah. my thoughts because I'm like, boy, things can change in eight years. Let me just see what I think of this. And 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 I hold on. Is she is she a fashion model? Yes. Or, or is that just the way everybody's dressed? No, no. It is. Okay. Yes, is to, yes to both. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's the same. Yes. The the answer to yeah is yes. No, no matter what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, people, everybody in there looks like that, and she is a fashion model, sort of. Uh, it's not really clear what any of these people are, as far as their professions. But I watched the movie and I re-listened to my five. And what's funny is I had accidentally bumped the thing on the five and it jumped to the middle, and I heard myself say, "Oh, it's awful!" And I went, "Really? I hated this because I love it now." And then I went back and re listened to it, and actually, I was talking about one particular thing. I actually liked it back then too, so that's fine. Because I was like, wow, I'm disagreeing with myself. This is real time travel type shit. But it's not. I like it. <laughs> so the whole essence of the film, it's it, there's almost nothing happens. That's what I'm saying. This is the, the height of art house pretension. But it is about aliens that come to Earth and they initially are looking for the brain reaction to opiates, but find that orgasms produce better results. And so they kill people when they have orgasms, right? Now, it, but it's really not even about that. It's just about making the most weird, arty 80s right. movie ever. You know what's very funny about this? Yes. This absolutely reminds me, in a weird way, of I Come in Peace. Sure. Oh, yeah. Because no, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that movie is basically... That's a '90s action movie, right? Yes, it? but it's and it's about a an alien that comes to Earth that basically starts uh, was it injecting people full of drugs? Yep, and then sucks the chemical reaction out of their brain. Yeah, or species, which is this is species. Yeah. Okay, sort of. I'm, uh, but it's it's both because well, okay. Let let's let's start at the beginning. I've pulled five clips because I have to. Uh, I, I just I, I this this movie so this yeah, one it's th just this it's is, just a shame because it's it's the visuals that really are something else oh it is but let me tell you you're gonna hear some stuff now because I'm going to give you just Whoa. a taste yes hold yeah, on yeah. yeah yeah go ahead this is interesting yeah so this was rare apparently because it was filmed in the U S but it was a Russian production team yeah it, it, from the yeah. Soviet Union yes interesting. And the lead, and one of the leads is a German, who okay. sounds like a Schwarzenegger imitator, which is great. You'll okay. hear. Him. Um, so yeah, it's it's a very weird movie all around. I mean, it, it, wow. And they're, yeah, go ahead. It spent it's, 28 weeks on Variety's top grossing film box office chart. Because the, I doubt there still is nothing. There's not quite anything like this that I've ever seen. It's so unique in. Because it captures a particular time period, I would bet real money that when you see people yeah. doing coke in the movie, they're doing coke doing in the movie. Because <laughs> there's no way this didn't come from heavy drugs. So it's it's all the things, all any one thing about this movie would make it fall apart if it was missing. But because it's all together, it is somehow fixating. You like you just can't stop watching it. It's okay. strange. So let's give you a little taste. And this is the soundtrack at the opening, because this is, oh boy, somebody played a Casio keyboard. Here we go. This is terrible. This is the whole. Well, this is the whole. Movie. <laughs> oh my god! This, uh, so it's that's so, the soundtrack. That is. That's. I mean, if, if the I, idea it, yeah. is to incite a sense of unease, then it's right. successful. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so that's the opening. As you see, this little UFO, that is literally, as far as I can tell, what looks like two plates glued together with a blue light in between. And it's that size. It's not supposed to be a big UFO. It's supposed to be a tiny little UFO. Because at one point, when the German scientist shows it to this woman who is actively trying to have sex with him for a, the most of the movie, and he just doesn't seem to be getting it for a while. And then when he realizes it, then he has to run out the door to help somebody. 
Uh, and she makes this remark where she says, oh, you're German? And he says, yes. And she's like, well, I'm Jewish. As if that's supposed to tell us something, but then it never becomes anything. And I thought, is that supposed to be a Night Porter reference or something? Where it's, is there supposed to be some angle to that? Because it never comes up again. So I don't really know what that was supposed to be. But we see the UFO land. But she remarks, she's like, it's so tiny. It looks like a couple of plates glued together. And he's like, well, you know, not all the aliens are big. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> man, you know, this is something. So the opening I, is that. I give, them, I give them credit. They lean into their own. No, no, uh, I, I like that. I like the fact that they just point it out because it lands next to a, a, a wine bottle and it's clearly smaller than the wine bottle. I mean, it literally is the size of two plates because that's what it is. So it lands and it starts kind of scanning the area. And as that music plays, so the whole opening is that music kind of on almost oh, a loop. Oh, it's a bit great. much, yeah. It's a, a bit much, but it's just kind of, like I said, it's so 80s. So it scans around, and it, 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 for whatever reason, it focuses on this little apartment where this woman named Margaret lives. Now, what's funny is, I didn't realize this when I watched it originally until after I'd watched it. I didn't realize it again this time until after I watched it. Margaret, the actress, plays Margaret the female and Jimmy the male. So she's playing dual roles. But you really, I didn't even notice it. I know they look similar, but because of the way they did the makeup, they don't look, you can't, I couldn't tell. Knowing it now, I would be able to put, pick it out. But well, one of, them is, one, of them is the, one of them is like the weird model with the face paint, right? Yes, that's Margaret. And the and other one Jimmy, is like, is, is in a suit. Yeah, the guy. Yeah. yeah. And so, but I mean, you could, I, I did notice, I, I at first could not tell what, was meant what the gender was supposed to be but then they get into this big thing about how anybody in this scene has to be androgynous that's how models are and that's how fashion works so i'm like oh, okay so this was intentionally kind of bouncing around with these ideas and so it lands on the thing and as it's landing and scanning we're cutting to a club where people are dancing around and margaret and jimmy are there and then margaret's girlfriend whose name is adrian then the, oh, oh, so I forgot. So Margaret gets uh, hit on by this guy. They go up to her place where she's apparently going to have sex with him. But then, you know, he's. I, I, oh, because he said she he had drugs. And so she went up there to do drugs. But then he wants to have sex first before he'll give her the drugs. And so uh, it's her and Jimmy. So Jimmy and her are having a fight about it because Jimmy wants to get high. And Margaret thought they were going to have sex. And Jimmy's like, I don't care. I just want to have drugs. And so they get into an argument. She's like, we have to go down because Adrian's about to do her performance. And then Adrian does her performance. And I, I highlighted it in my review from back then, but I didn't have sound to be able to play <laughs> for everybody. And I do now. So you get just now. I want you to picture this. Okay. I want you to picture a small, uh, somewhat skinny woman with long brown hair, big kind of alien eyes. Uh, dressed all in black with what looks like, well, I guess it was a, a beatbox hanging off of her side, like some kind of sound production machine. Okay. Now I didn't capture the entire thing because it would be like 10 minutes long because they keep intercutting it. So you don't see the performance all together. You keep jumping back and forth and back and forth, but it starts off. I don't have this particular part where she's holding the microphone to her heart so that the audience who is all gathered around her in a club can hear her heartbeat, and then she just starts doing word beatboxing. And I'm going to now play what is probably the best segment of the whole thing, but it's not its entirety. This is a, only a minute of probably what is, I'm going to guess, actually six or seven minutes of what, for all I know, was an actual performance that this person did as an actual person in life. But I wouldn't be shocked either way. So here we go. Enjoy this because it is magnificent. Here you go. My rhythm box is sweet. Never forget the beer. Never eats, it never shits, it never sleeps. It only thinks. It's a fool, it does its rules.
Yeah, so, so that happens. So yeah. you know when yeah. you're in an era, but you didn't realize you're in an era. Yes, and you're just doing stuff like it's normal, right? And then twenty years down the road, people look back thirty years down, and they, and they go, "Yeah, the '80s were really weird." Right? Yes, yes. <laughs> like that's what I'm saying. It would not surprise me even a little if this was a real performance that this person did or I, saw somebody I doing think, it. I think I've heard music. Sorry, oh. I, I'm leaning away from the mic. I, I think I think I've heard music like so this. have I. You know, no, this, what, there's you know, this, a part where she sings it. Like me. this reminds me of something I've heard yeah, this well, before. Her her voice reminds me of Susie from Susie and the Banshees. Sure, but or, like or a lot music, of '80s singers. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, where yeah. It's like, <laughs> yeah. But yes, exceptionally pretentious. Right. So that that's so that happens, and it probably is the best part of the movie is this performance. Because it is so unhinged <laughs> and, and and just, I mean, almost like it's a, if Mel Brooks had been doing it, it would be a comedy. You know, it, it's, it's so funny. Oh, no. You know what this would pop up in? This would pop up in um, oh, Zoolander. Sure. Yeah. Abs- abs- this is, yes. Th- it would not shock me if Zoolander had stuff based off this, of somebody seeing this and being like, oh, we have to incorporate whatever. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> right? So. After we get this, which really doesn't provide anything in terms of the alien plot whatsoever. I, I really feel like this was just something that they wanted to shoot. Fine. But it is mystif- it's mystifying to watch it. It's just great. <laughs> so then we then cut to the German guy arrives and he shows up and he goes in and he meets with this guy. And we now get the explanation for what the alien is. And I will play what he says because... Again, I don't think this person was probably a professional actor and may not have had the best command of English, but that both makes it better and funnier. So I'll play it. In the beginning, uh, aliens were spotted in places with large amounts of heroin. Later, aliens appeared in specific subcultures, punk circles, still around heroin, (laughs) and in these punk circles, many more strange deaths have occurred. What's so strange about death in punk circles? They kill each other by uh, shooting too much dope. Don't you remember when we were at um, Cambridge? There was a war, I think, between the, uh, they were called uh, mods and rockers, and they, they went at each other with bicycle chains. Now, I don't think your punks need help from the outside to kill themselves. You interrupted me. The most interesting fact we found, these killings occur during sexual intercourse. show you the documentation of our progress. We have not only located the UFO, but we have managed to photograph the creature inside of the craft, and even made an attempt to classify its various emotional states. What's your schedule like? I need your help. I cannot get too close because it recognizes me and I'm a stranger in this country. There are some things which are difficult for me to study because of that. I, I watched the creature from the Empire State Building, but at night it is closed. How can I study the behavior of this creature if it's on, um, on private property? Well, I don't know. I, I'd like to help you, but uh, I don't know what you expect me to do. I'm just a college acting teacher. Okay, so we get the explanation that these that aliens is, are apparently... Yeah, yeah. Go that ahead. is a hell of an accent i mean isn't it, is it? <laughs> i mean yeah. yeah my brain just kept going get to the chopper get to the right, chopper right. that's why i said um, it sounds like an arnold but honestly there. but oddly there's a there's an interesting kind of cadence to it though like it doesn't oh, yeah. feel yeah. like you know you're like i don't think he was an actor yeah but there is kind of a really of a natural way you know uh, it it doesn't f- it, it doesn't feel as artificial as i thought it was gonna feel no 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 it's it's not bad i just but there's certain things where he doesn't i have a feeling that this was one of those things where they basically helped him repeat it in english repeat it and somebody okay. say okay but say this a little differently because there's ways that and throughout the movie there's oh so not, he doesn't speak he doesn't speak english 
Well, this is life? okay. Famously, one of the things I don't know, but famously okay. in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, when they show up in that village and the leader of yeah. the village is talking to them, one of the things is that person spoke no English and basically they just kept repeating his Bank, words. Yeah. Bank, Bangkok Palace. Right. Yeah. And so they just kind of, and they would help him when he would say something wrong or whatever and say, we'll yeah. say it like this. And I have a feeling that this this individual did not speak a lot of English and so probably was saying things. But there's parts where he has abrupt kind of jumps and transitions where a person who is more naturally speaking would not say things that way. So it's not that he didn't understand what he was saying, but he may not have been fluent enough the same way that if I speak in Italian. It is understandable, but it is by no means going to be mistaken by somebody in the country as yes, me knowing get, everything yeah. I'm saying. You know what I mean? I'm yeah, putting I, the I, words I, together, but I'm not I understanding gotcha. the flow correctly. It's like that. I got, yeah. So, no, no. It's very listenable. In fact, I found him to be a mesmerizing, like almost like listening to Werner Herzog. Like, it's like, oh, wow. this is Yeah, this is yeah. I could see that. Yeah. Yeah. So that part's fine. It's nothing. Uh, but I don't think he did speak it naturally or, or fluently because sometimes he has these weird jumps in how he's talking that. In, or that he just wasn't able to act in English. Maybe it's that. So whatever it is. Perfectly fine. Listen, by far the most normal person in the movie. By far. So whatever. <laughs> so after this, we start to, uh, and I'm not going I, I, to go over every little detail because it honestly doesn't matter in a movie like this. But essentially what happens is Margaret is continually assaulted throughout the middle of the movie by different men. And uh, I mean, literal rape in some cases very aggressive sexual encounters in some cases and what starts to happen is in none of them does she have an orgasm but the men do and they start dying basically when they orgasm this special effect happens it looks like predator vision mixed with something david lynch would do and a crystal dart suddenly is shot into their skulls and at first, and th- th- bu- does a giant alien yell, I come in peace? <laughs> and no, sadly, sadly not. That would be that would be fantastic. And so at first, when this happens, the first person it happens to is the guy who said, I'm just a, an acting teacher. Yeah. Uh, in a very gross scene where he shows up and Margaret has got to be 20 to 30 years younger than him. And he's hitting on her and kind of coerces her into sex somewhat consensually, but not really. She's just kind of laying there again because she's not enjoying any of this. And he gets killed and his body is there and the girlfriend comes in because Adrian is her girlfriend. And although she's also horribly abusive towards her, but her abuse is more emotional until a certain point where she also rapes her. But we'll get to that because that's a whole scene in itself. Um, And she's like, oh, well, we'll just put the body in a cardboard box and leave it outside. Who cares? You know, nobody's going to miss him. And so they have the body outside in a box. And then she's talking about the fact that she likes to fuck dead bodies. So she's like, well, I can have at least I can have sex with him. So, you know, that's the we'll save him just for that. Oh, Uh, God. This is is the beatbox artist. Yeah, she's a wackadoo. Uh, So so eventually this all kind of leads up to a. Oh, in fact, I forgot. There is a sound clip for when the body is laying there and they first realize he's dead because she can't resist the need to beatbox about his death. Now, let me set this up correctly because you'll hear the sound effect, but I want to make sure you know what it is. As they discover the body, she kneels. This is the crazy beatboxer kneels in front of the body and begins punching herself in the leg. And at first I'm like, why is she punching herself? And then I realized she's setting a beat so that she could start doing her spoken word. And then... She does this again. Enjoy. So you're dead now, shit. And you're going to hell. Straight from your marijuana jungles. Straight from your lies, your lies, your lies. You drop dead fucking. It suits you well. You go to hell. We'll go to hell. I'll go to hell, too, but I know I'm damned, and you never knew. So you weren't ready to toll the bell. (laughs) For me, it's easy. From hell to hell, I'm not dancing in marijuana jungles. I live in concrete mazes, stone and glass, hard like my heart, sharp and clean, with no romantic illusions to changing the world. I don't lie to myself that love can cure because I know I'm alone. She's clearly making this up on the spot. Every day 
You lived. You lied. Died. You lied. You go to hell. What um, suits you well. What what is the point of this in the movie? I don't okay. know. I really, I really, th- okay. I'm telling you, I think this woman was we're gonna, probably we're, a performance We're going to call this character development. <laughs> sure. Because <laughs> it doesn't add anything. It just happens. But again, it's oh, man, one of those things you know, where you're like, wow. You, you know what she reminds me of, weirdly, though? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, so, because, you know, the, the voice, like, think where we've heard that cadence before. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's going to sound weird, but if you listen to the Neuromancer audiobook, there's a point in the book where uh, William Gibson, who read the this version of it, is trying to change his voice because he's doing uh, uh, Case's girlfriend, Lyra, Lyra Lynn, was it Lyra, Jesus Christ, what's her name? Lyra Lynn Lee or whatever? Um, Loretta Lee, his, isn't it Loretta, Loretta Lee? I can't remember. No, Basically, the girlfriend, the girlfriend that, that, that robs him and then she gets killed later on and then he sees sure. her kind of ghost in the, uh, the into the, the winter moot uh, like uh, uh, fake world but when uh, Gibson is trying to kind of like do her voice which a lot of audiobook people do they try to like you know, if, if it's a male reading a female they try to like you know he kind of sounds like this woman because some of the things that that the 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 dead girlfriend says when they're in the uh, the the kind of holographic brain space, are like very sort of dreamlike, um, and it reminds me of this woman. He, she was doing the beatbox thing, and it kept nagging at me. I was like, "What well, sounds like something I've heard before?" Um, that's but yes, but she is clearly kind of just making that up. Oh yeah, she's uh, repeating <laughs> things. That's what I'm saying. I I wouldn't be shocked. It doesn't say, so I don't know. Yeah, if this person was an actual performance, but I artist. mean, it, it is. It, it, yeah, we'll call it character development. It's it, yeah. It adds. Hold on, I'm looking up Paula <laughs> Shepard. That's the actress's name. Uh, New Jersey raised Paula Shepard. Oh, performing as a dancer in a local play. Okay, so uh, seven, several years later, she made her but second it, and final. But film it also appearance. makes me think of. Uh, it also makes me think of how. Uh, so I married an axe murderer. Yeah. Harriet, sweet Harriet. You know, like it's that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's a strange. Yeah. <laughs> But it's very hypnotic. It's, I mean, she's the most watchable thing when she's doing this. Like, she blows everything else away. Because it's just, like, such an, uh, again, unhinged performance. It's great. So they do that. Then they put the body in a box. They store it. So then the middle of it is now Margaret starts to figure out that the aliens are... The aliens, she thinks the aliens are... Uh, she calls them... I think she calls them Indian is as a name. I don't know what that's supposed to mean. I don't know if she just came up with a name out of nowhere. I don't know why she starts calling them that, but she starts to think that the alien is either a phantasm or she doesn't realize it's an alien necessarily. She seems to think it's some person or some, she keeps saying it when she's looking at the empire state building. So I don't know if she thinks the empire state building is alive or something, but then she starts actually actively finding these men who tried to assault her or did and trying to lure them back into the apartment oh, because so now she, she starts, can kill them. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. Yes. Right. Now, at first, they are dying with a little crystal in their head. But then they're doing a fashion shoot there because she is a model. And for whatever reason, they start kind of ganging up with her and Jimmy and they're, they're trying to get Jimmy to have sex with her for some reason. And so she starts to go down on him because they basically the whole room has pressured her to. And she keeps trying to say, don't you don't want to do this because something bad's going to happen. And he's like, no, you're going to do it. And so when he orgasms, the alien kills him. But then the alien, for whatever reason, turns him into tinfoil, which she then sucks into her body and he disappears and everybody sees it. And they're like, wait a minute. And they're like, uh, man, that's the most amazing performance I've ever well, seen. Well, they were all man. they're all snorting coke during the thing. So oh, they're like, okay. wait, where, where is he? Must be they you you that, yeah, they think it's a magic act. They're like, oh, you yeah. know, you've got him out on the balcony or something like that. And she keeps saying, No, I'm telling you that when when somebody has sex with me and they have an orgasm, they die. At which point Adrian grabs her and says, Well, you're gonna fuck me to death and starts scissoring her. Until she orgasms and turns into tinfoil and is ingested, I guess, into her vagina. It's unclear, but that's where she was positioned. And now everybody <laughs> believes what? her. I'm so, not kidding. Yeah. So she's like, I know it'll kill me, 
I want you to see. I almost death. pulled the clip, but it's it's not the, <laughs> the audio is tough. But she's basically saying, "Yeah, fuck me to death, fuck me to death, fuck me like that." She's saying that, like literally saying. Okay. okay I should okay. have pulled the clip, but I was like, "Okay, I've got no, too many clips no, in this movie. yeah, right. it's uh, yeah, okay, right." So <laughs> across the street, the German scientist and the woman who keeps trying to seduce him are watching this happen, and the German says, "Oh no, she's in trouble." Because, you know, I don't think she realizes that she's not killing these people, that the alien is, I've got to go rescue her. So he leaves. The woman who's very upset, having watched two people die, not that they're dead, but that this guy ran out on her. Uh, so she, so he leaves. He runs over and gets there. And then we have this bit of dialogue, which is my last clip for this movie. So here we go. What do you want? My name is Jorn Hoffman. I'm a scientist. I've come to get you out of here. We should leave immediately. What do you know? I've watched you through your window. I have witnessed the death from over there. I know how and why they died. You're in great danger. Come with me. So you tell me why they died. What difference does it make to you now? Come with me. Wait a minute. You come in my place and you want me to leave and you don't want to tell me why? Okay, you have a creature, an alien creature on your roof. Where? I study these creatures. You are in great danger. Come with me. Tell me where he is. You want to die? No. L let me explain. Let me go. Let me explain. Let my go. theory is my theory is that these creatures, aliens, feed of people like we feed of other creatures, that they need for sustenance a substance similar to opiates. Heroin is an opiate. So this one came here for it, and we found something better. That substance is produced in the brain during orgasm, and is similar in chemical structure to opiates. It is killing to get this substance. Well, he didn't kill me, did he? Why didn't he kill me? Did you have an orgasm? And so she says, she basically shakes her head no, so it's not in the clip. But she basically shakes her head no, and he's like, well, that's why. And she's like, I don't believe you. Show me this alien. And he's like, fine. So he takes her outside, and the alien is just right on the roof. I mean, she just looked up. The little plates are right there. So he, he points up, and he's like, there's the alien right there. At which point she sa he says, I'm going to try to destroy them or, you know, capture them. And she says, no. She takes out a knife and stabs him in the back and kills him. So she kills the German. <laughs> At which okay. point the woman from across the street sees him get stabbed and leaves and runs over to try to figure out, you know, to help him. And she's there. And another woman is there from another subplot that honestly doesn't even matter. It's, it's so I forgot all about them because they're they're basically it's just one more guy that tries to have sex with her and gets killed. So that's the only reason this other woman is there, because that's his girlfriend. So the two of them are there and they're looking for her. And she's yelling at the alien. Uh, take me, Indian. Take me. I, I can be with you now. I've killed the guy trying to kill you. You know, we can be together again. I don't know what what together means for her, but something, I guess, because this is the only person who seems to care about her, maybe or whatever. And so then they look up and she's on the roof and the the spaceship shoots out a beam and she does what I would call a David Lynch, like weird kind of stitching spasm thing and then the screen all goes white she vanishes the spaceship lifts off and takes off and we get credits and more of da -da 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 -da, like the music comes up and that's it so i don't know what i'm supposed to make of that ending but honestly it doesn't matter i mean it does it doesn't matter it, it this is this is a pure weirdo art house film that I, what was the movie? I just talked about a movie where I said I don't think more than five or ten people on the planet would rewatch this movie. What the hell was it? I just reviewed it. Was well, this the werewolf, uh, the werewolf biker movie? Yeah, werewolves, werewolves on yeah. wheels. Okay, this is the same <laughs> thing, except I think that in this case, there's probably a thousand people on the planet that would rewatch it, as opposed to ten. I don't I, know. I, I they were on twice. like they were on that best of list for a while. I mean, that's a good point. I, obviously, people were watching, but I mean, it is such a. I, I believe originally it was probably watched by people who were extraordinarily high, on something, and they were like, "Yeah, <laughs> look at this shit." You know, like no, it's no. fucking wacko. Or, or the people living in the eighties were looking for a movie that was maximum eighties, and this well, was yeah, but it is yeah. that. It is that. So so it is out on a Blu-ray from Vinegar Syndrome, of course. I have it. It's excellent. Um, if you're into this kind of weird shit, uh, if you're not, boy, will you be bored and or 
confused. I, I think more confused than anything. It's not boring. Did, I shouldn't say it's boring. Did the it's too weird. did the uh, did the German guy? Did he do anything else? Because his voice is very. Well, it sounds like, like Arnold. Uh, I don't know. Let's see. Let's take a look. I didn't look. Let me take a look. Uh, did he do anything else? That guy's name is. Hold on. He because is... Anna, Anna the Carlisle. She went on to do like kind of bit work and other stuff. Yeah. So Johan would be him. Otto von Wernher. Uh, so it, he so was on w- Perfect Strangers for an episode. Oh my I know. God. Uh, he did five movies. Or, so, uh, sorry, he did so five. So what, was, what was the name of the of the crazy beatboxer? Um, that was Susanna Shepard. She basically quit acting to do something else. She was a dancer, did some movie work, and then quit. So she didn't her really name, do much of it. Her name is Susanna Shepard. I believe it's Susanna. Or, hold on, let me go back. And Paul, it, it, Paula, Paula Shepherd? E. Shepard. Sorry, Paula E. Shepard. Oh my god, yeah, she she doesn't look she doesn't look, look at, at all the way. Oh wait. <laughs> yes. No, she doesn't look the way I thought she was gonna look. Oh, there's a picture of her with the beatbox. Yeah. yeah, there she is. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, well, because in uh, in that other picture, she looks really young. That looks like a very yeah. young, young picture of her. Like the Alice, sweet Alice, I think is that picture, and that's from six years before this. So she was probably extremely. Yeah, that that's a, she had to be very young in that. Um, very. There's young. there's a soundtrack for this, and she's on it. Oh, then I'm gonna buy it. <laughs> I'm gonna, yeah. I, I will i will buy it she has a track on on the soundtrack uh, me and my rhythm probably, box it, it, that's it that's this oh yeah because i told you it goes on it's not yeah. short oh it's not yes short. i wonder if they fully like they did they, they, oh, they fully recorded that as a song i can only imagine i i have a feeling it was a real thing yeah i think it was a real thing <laughs> so the guy actually yeah. the german guy was on a series for 23 episodes called the edge of night from 1984 so a couple of years after this, and he is, um, it says he's in every episode. So I guess he was in a bunch of it. Yeah. Edge of Night is, it's apparently a crime show of some kind. Yeah. So there you go. So he did do some stuff. A, a German show or a. Uh... No, American. No, American. It stars uh, Forrest Compton and Ann Flood. I don't know them, but they sort of look familiar. No, there's lots of big names. Lori Laughlin's in it. Edge of Night. I've never even yeah, heard of this. Well, it's, I mean, it's 1984. It, oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. It says 1956 to 84. So what was this one they revived? Oh, yeah, there's black and white pictures. I guess this was an old series that then got redone or, or continued. Wow, that's really weird. Huh. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Well, there you go. So, yes, he did some other stuff. Nobody else seems to have done anything. So, anyway, that's Liquid Sky. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, Th- those sound clips will either sell you on it or not by themselves. It, if you want to watch a 80s as hell film that is clearly the product of Coke and no care about if the movie really makes sense, this might be your film. It's probably still on YouTube in a, cr- in a crude form. So if you watch that and you're intrigued, you can buy the better copy. And it is a very, 80s very is he- copy. 80s as hell. Okay. Oh, it is. I mean, it. oh, God, is it. Uh, so... <laughs> now the movie I have more to say about. Now you have seen Cast the Deadly Spell, right? I'm sure you have. Which one's that? That's the one. Where, oh god, what's the guy's name? Uh, it's the Lovecraft movie, but it's the kind of funny one where the guy from Oh, uh, with Fred Ward. That's it. I was gonna say the Tremors. Oh, guy. Yeah, I love that movie. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So you've seen that one. Have you... you seen? Yeah. 1994's Witch Hunt with Dennis Hopper, the reimagining of it. A witch Hunt, what, in 1984? 94, 94, because it came after Cast the Deadly on. Spell. Yeah. Have you seen this? Is it is it supposed to be the same character? I Yeah, as far as I can tell. Philip, it's, Philip, H. Philip Lovecraft? That's it. Yep. H. Philip Lovecraft. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I heard of this, but I never saw okay. it. Okay, okay. So, this has, this has but been this is supposed, But this is supposed to be... Almost like a sequel, isn't it? Like it's the same world? From what I read, no. Yeah. Because that's what most people think because it's the same name. But from what I've read, and it does make sense more because there's no character. Well, uh, maybe it's maybe it's because it was made by HBO. It's an HBO TV movie. Right. And on the so, release, it says it's a kind of magic. Yeah. Which was the same tagline they used for the Fred Ward movie. So what I believe this is, is what we would today call a reimagining. This was them taking the same idea and doing a new version of it. Okay. Because 
I, I don't, it's definitely not a sequel or if it is, it makes no sense to be a sequel because there's no indication. The other movie came first. There are elements of the other one in this, but without any narrative connection. I, I don't, I don't believe it's a sequel. Right. I mean, you could watch I'm it. Going you could to. Determine that. I'm going okay. to, I'm going to look to see if there's any explanation for this. Yeah, I mean, I, because I, there are lots of people who are like, it's a sequel. And then other people are like, no, it's not. It doesn't make, how could it be a sequel? Because this happens. So, um, the movie starts out and there is a narration saying that magic is commonplace. Uh, the, yeah, the, okay, the official line, right, from HBO mm-hmm. was that it is a reinterpretation of the concept. There you go. That makes complete sense. So anybody who there says there is no con- there is there there is no continuity. There, that's that's a, what I'm saying. It is a it is a reinterpretation of the concept. Right. So let's get this out of the way up front. Cast a Deadly Spell is a better movie, in terms of just purely this. Uh, my comparisons in my five, and I'll make them again here are Predator, Predator Two, Cast a Deadly Spell is Predator, Witch Hunt is Predator Two. I'm oh, but Predator pretend. Two is a very fun movie. Uh, that's right. <laughs> right. So, but. If you were to tell somebody which is the better movie, would you have to but think here's about the thing. it for more than two okay. seconds? <clears throat> I, I would. I would because oh, see, I, would. I love Predator. Predator is a great movie, right? Yeah. But I have found so much enjoyment with well, Predator okay. 2. Well, okay, so have I. And I've, seen, Pre- no... and I've seen I've I have watched Predator 2 more than I've watched the first Predator. So I have, love them well, both. Well, I wouldn't say I've watched it more, but um, – I love them both, but there is Predator no way one that I would is, tell somebody. Predator 1 is the better movie. That's what, yes. I'm, that's is, what I'm saying. It's not to say is don't Witch watch Hunt, Predator 2. But is Witch Hunt a fun movie? Yes, and that's why I'm making that direct okay. comparison, that both of them can coexist. So because they maintain two, they maintain the comedy, but they maintain the comedy element, well, or they get dark? The comedy is intermittent, more than it is okay. in Cast a Deadly Spell. So it's, so it's less funny than, than Cast a Deadly Spell. It's less. It's it's trying to be less funny. It's not okay. it, the comedic elements are different. I don't know how else to put it. Okay. Almost the, the same way that Predator Two has a very different feeling than Pre- Predator Two isn't a horror movie. Predator One, kind of is. I mean, it is guys being hunted. Oh yeah, in the jungle. yeah. Right. Whereas Predator Two is more like okay, this is just silly now, and it's going to have a good time, and that's what you have. That's yeah. what this is. So, Dennis Hopper is playing the Lovecraft character. Okay. So we get this opening that sets up the world, which is basically L.A. L.A. in the 40s, 50s, whatever. I think it's supposed to be 50s, where magic is now used by everybody. So it's a commonplace thing. There's no, well, I'll play his explanation. So here is your opening to the world that we're going to be in. It started off small. It wasn't a conspiracy or anything. It was like, uh, it was just like a fad. Somebody bent a spoon or levitated their dog. Next thing you knew, it was starting to spread. Pretty soon the whole neighborhood was doing it. And in a little while, it was all over the place. Like a Tupperware party. Still, I never thought it was evil. It was just natural. It's human curiosity. At worst, I thought it was a crutch. Magic can make people lazy. And if you're not careful, it can creep up on you. Instead of taking out the trash, the trash takes out itself. Instead of washing the dishes, you just encourage them. Nobody sees it happen to them just happens so it makes my job a little tougher but it's nothing to get hysterical about last year it was hula hoops and senator crockett never held congressional hearings about that sure i get tempted to use it who doesn't but in my business it's better just to work clean so what he's referring to when he says senator crockett is in the opening as it's showing us people like lighting their cigarettes from their hands and yeah, like yeah, levitating yeah. things. There's a senator in the background, and this movie has no subtlety. Just understand that from the beginning. It is essentially a senator, and instead of it being communism and McCarthyism, it's Crockettism and magic. So magic is going to secretly corrupt everybody. It's And his target is specifically Hollywood, that magic has infested Hollywood. He wants to have hearings because he thinks it's ruining this country. So basically, there's, there's uh, putting in, instead of communism, now it's magic. Right. That's what it is. So we get this opening explains that where he talks about his attitude towards it. And we see him, you know, he finds a guy and they criminally, criminally waste Debbie Mazar. She's in one scene. When I saw her name, I was like, oh, I love Debbie Mazar. She's in one scene as a blonde. 
which fine, I guess, but that's a complete waste of how gorgeous she is with dark hair. Oh, anyway, yes, I, yes, okay. Yeah, it's it's not good. It's not a good look. But she's barely, she's in mo- movie for literally two or three lines and she's gone. So I don't even know why her name's in the credits. I mean, I guess because she's a, a known name, but she's not in the movie. It is like a glorified cameo. Yeah, it's, it's I, I, the more I read about this, it feels like an unnecessary reinterpretation of Cast the Deadly Spell. Well, well, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Okay. But I don't know if I'd say unnecessary. I don't mind that it exists because Julian Sands is great in it. So that alone for me okay. and, and Dennis Hopper. I mean, Dennis Hopper is always good. In- apparently he said this is one of the weirdest movies he ever did. Oh, I'm sure. Because there's there are weird things. This is the other thing that I think justifies it. Not at the time they were making it, their intent. Yeah. But now to watch it, there's weird decisions that I like. So. Uh, Dennis Hopper does this narration after he, he hands this guy back to his wife who she, he owes money to her for alimony or whatever. And we see him go into his office and he works uh, in the same across from a licensed witch whose name is. I mean, I, I always thought it was pronounced Hippolyta, but apparently it's Hi, Hippolyta or something. Whatever. I'm just going to call her. I'm just going to call her licensed witch played by Cheryl. Cheryl Lee Ralph is the actress's name. She's very good. And so he goes into his office and uh, he runs into Penelope Ann Miller and Penelope Ann Miller, who's always good, is in his office and basically says, yeah, I uh, I'm married to one of these big shop producers whose name is Gottlieb. And I am pretty sure that he has decided to have an affair with this young actress that he's cast in the movie that I'm in because he keeps giving her more and more screen time. And I want you to, uh, fo- to to follow him, basically almost like Roger Rabbit style. This becomes yeah, very Roger Rabbit later. Find incriminating evidence, yeah. Yeah, find out what's going on. So he's like, okay, I'll do it. Here's my price. She's like, here you go, and she leaves. And so he goes up to the roof, and the witch is having a seance up there, like a perfectly normal thing. So he's just smoking a cigarette. She's having a seance with a pentagram and everything. And when the thing breaks up, he's like, uh, yeah, listen, I'm uh, I'm trying to figure out. Uh, I'm trying to find out about this guy Gottlieb. And she's like, oh, well, come with me. I got to go meet with him. And he's like, all right. So he tags along with her. They go to this warehouse. Gottlieb and his entourage show up. And basically the witch stands there and, and like throws some bones on the ground and then says a spell. And when she says the spell, the words physically materialize and come out of her mouth like physically, and they're like swirling around and they create this portal and a individual materializes and you find out that it's William Shakespeare. And Gottlieb's like, great, now I've got a great writer I can use to make movies. And they basically take Shakespeare, who as far as we can tell is Shakespeare moved out of the past and into the present and they take him and throw him in the back of a car against his will and drive off. (laughs) And so it's like, what the fuck? All right, so they've got him. And so then, uh, uh, so uh, Lovecraft and Licensed Witch are walking out, at which point they spot Julian Sands. And Lovecraft's like, I'll catch up with you. I got to go talk to him. And we get this little piece of dialogue, which is on the nose foreshadowing, but it's, I'll play anything with Julian Sands in it because he was great in almost everything I saw him in. So we get this little bit of dialogue to set up things that will happen later. Fen Mark, sir. Moses on a pony if it isn't Phil Lovecraft. Well, how's the world treating you, dickface? I thought you were in Chicago. Oh, you miss the friendly people and the orange juice. What are you doing for Godly? Privileged information. But from one large member to another, he called me in as a security consultant and expediter. I tie up loose ends. It seems to me they're still looking for a couple of people you expedited. Are you still chasing naughty husbands, dick face, and drying the tears of those poor lonely wifey poos? Tell me something, honestly. Do I look like I have a dick on my face? <laughs> That's why I like you, Phil. I like to take things apart, see how they work. Watches, phonographs, people. I like to see inside. Now, what we see here is a drop of magical liquid with a snake in it. It'll be important later. Hmm. Well, I'll see you around, Phil. 
I don't think so. Oh, there's no doubt about it. You and me, we've still got business to settle. Right. Okay. So we know that they know each other. They have a history. And yeah. he does this thing, that, that part where he said, I like to see inside, and then you get that sound effect. He threw his cigarette down, and it turned into a pile, a, a pile of liquid with a red snake running through it. Right? Yeah. So that's obviously a setup for something later, which you'll hear a sound bit about, and we'll get into that. So uh, Lovecraft decides to, uh, to tail Gottlieb to this house that he drives up to, and when he gets there, you see, and throughout the movie, there's neat little stuff like I like they sprinkle how people use magic in really subtle ways without really even though I said the movie isn't subtle. It is when it comes to this, because what we see is when they pull up, it's raining and a guy comes out to open the door for them. And the guy has a umbrella levitating above it, but he's not holding it. It's just there. So they don't make a big deal of it. But you just see all these little ways that people use small time magic, which I like. So uh, this guy comes out to escort them and then a raven with demon eyes holding a red snake lands on the car looks at lovecraft and he passes out okay so then he wakes up and of course the cars are gone it's the next day so he goes back to his office and then we cut to uh, gottlieb's office he's in a producer's office he's got two doberman pinchers and he's in there and uh, penelope ann miller who i'll just call pam because it's easier pam is, you know, ranting and raving about the fact that her role is getting smaller and the other actresses is getting bigger. And Gottlieb essentially just comes out and says, you know what? Yeah, you caught me. I don't care. You're fired. I'm going to go with her. She's better than you in almost every way anyway. And so she says, fine, you know, uh, you know, I'll, I'll get mine from you in court or something like that. She storms out. And when she storms out, she then says this line, which I will keep just as an evergreen because this is a wonderful Penelope Ann Miller line and I'm just going to play it because I love it. This isn't the first time I've been fucked in a producer's office. Yeah, I don't really know what I'll use that for, but I'm going to keep it. It's just too good. So, yeah, that's just great. So she says that. She, you know, again, stomps out. And then what we see is... Gottlieb, after that, closes his doors, goes back in to make a call, and then he starts to, he sits down in his chair, and then, like, he starts to kind of notice something is wrong, and he starts shrinking. He literally is shrinking, and he shrinks and shrinks and shrinks so much that he looks like a piece of meat to his dogs, who then eat him. So then we cut to uh, uh, Lovecraft shows up at Pam's house, or Penelope Ann Miller's house, and she says, well, I tried to follow him to this house. And she's like, stay away from that house. He's like, why? And she's like, don't worry about it. That house isn't, it isn't involved in this. And it doesn't matter anyway. He fired me. So it doesn't, what's the point? You know, I'll pay you what I owe you, but it's over with because I know now what I need to know and you can't help me. At which point her phone rings and she picks it up and it's the cops calling her to tell her that Gottlieb is dead. So now we cut back to Gottlieb's office and there is a hysterical little tiny chalk outline near his desk. This is what I mean about the humor is, is like it's, it's intermittent, but it's great. And next to it is a napkin with some blood stains that is clearly covering his body. And, and so the, the, uh, I don't know if the sound clip has this or not, but the coroners come in with a stretcher and he's like, what do you need a stretcher for? Just go get a lunchbox. And they literally bring in a lunchbox and put the body in it to carry it out. Right. So then Lovecraft shows up and he knows the cops, so he kind of goes over and we get this little exchange here. What the hell are you doing here? It's good to see you too, Bradbury. What happened? Come on, give. I'm a friend of the widows. What happened? Somebody put the big whammy on Gottlieb and cut him down to size. Wow. And? Ever see two dogs play tug of war with a bone? Forget the gurney. You can get him out of here in a lunch pail. Yeah, there it is. Oh, you thinking of something? I'm thinking that according to this lady, the last person to see Gottlieb before he got small was your friend, the widow. Okay, okay, break it up. This is a police investigation. Come on. Lieutenant Bradbury, heard good things about you. Barson Crockett. What's being done about this ghastly business? We're working on it. Good. This is just another example of how magic has shot its sinister tentacles into the motion picture industry. I give my personal pledge that soon a new day will dawn on a witch-free America. 
a more wholesome country. As we proceed with our Los Angeles sense. hearings and prepare our patriotism rally, I America thought the magic was trouble, but now, now that they're trying to outlaw the stuff, magic. how come I'm not so actor? happy? If God doesn't the destroy Senator? Hollywood, yeah, you'll know him when you see him, but I don't know Sodom his name and offhand. Uh, an apology. But, you know. So basically, yeah, the senator comes in, makes a big show of why this is yet another example of how magic is bad. And so then we cut to the funeral where they're basically putting a very tiny coffin or whatever into the ground. And in the background, we see Lovecraft. Oh, jeez, it's him. Okay. He's yeah. been in a Eric, million things. Eric Bogosian. Yeah. There you go. He's been yeah. in a ton and of He's stuff, been in a yeah. million things. Yeah. So you know his voice. You know his face. And so Pam is, is there at the funeral and she runs into Lovecraft and she's like, all right, well, now I need you to clear my name because it seems like maybe they're going to frame me for this because the cops are kind of following me around and they think I have something to do with this. And he's like, all right, well, sure, you know, I'll, I'll look into it for you because I don't think you have anything to do with it, so I'll look into it. So he goes back and meets with the witch and he's like, look, I want you to come up to the house that I followed them to and see if you can figure out anything or whatever, if you know anybody who can help. And she's like, yeah, I know a couple people. And so she brings a, a woman and a man with her. The woman is, I think it's psychometry, is the thing where you touch something and you can tell. Yes, what, yes. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. what it's supposed to be, yeah. Okay, so she's a psychometrist, I guess. And the guy, the guy can do weird things like start cars that won't start. But I don't know what his power set necessarily is because he doesn't do all that much. He's just kind of there for little exposition bits here and there, but he's just there. So the woman goes and she's reading the car and says, okay, uh, the car that's in the driveway and says, okay, there was a, a man, there were two men and two women or something like that, or two men and a, and a woman or, or a man and a woman. I can't remember what the number was. And they went in the house. So let's go in the house. So they go in the house and she goes in and she says, there's nothing here. And he says, okay, well, you know, sometimes there's nothing to read. And she's like, no, no, no. She's like, somebody wiped the house. Like there's somebody came in and wiped everything out. There were memories. I, I shouldn't be seeing nothing. I should just be seeing emptiness or like empty memories. But this has been magically wiped, right? So then Harry finds a little broken stem of a martini glass. And he's like, okay, well, that's a clue, I guess. And then he goes to the house because this house is not the house that Pam was warning him against. And that's a different house. So he goes to that one. And that's the one where he got knocked out earlier. The one where the raven appeared. So yes. he goes and he's trying to sneak in. And he gets caught and he gets knocked out. He wakes up. And we see the guy. There's two guys. One is the guy who was opening the door that had the little magic umbrella. And then there's like a young guy. And the big guy who doesn't say anything leaves the room. And the other guy is basically watching Lovecraft. And he says, hey, I... I didn't realize people still used zombies. So what we find out is the big guy is the zombie. That's why he's not speaking. And the guy's like, yeah, yeah well, a lot of, a lot of this is, is stuff from right? the other one. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's bits and okay. pieces where I was, I was remembering the other movie. I'm like, okay, yeah. okay. I remember bits of this. And the guy's like, yeah, you know, you can use them for a couple months before they start to rot. And he's like, oh, okay. So he knocks the kid out. Cause this is a young kid. And he's like, realizes he's inexperienced. So he knocks him out. And then he sneaks up to this room. And in the room, there is a woman playing a piano. And another individual who is playing a woman, but the actor is a man. So I don't know what that's supposed to be. I don't know if we're supposed to know that's a man or not, because it's never pointed out. They just, and, and the name is a female name, Vivian. So I don't know what that's supposed to be. I don't know if there's a larger maybe, commentary maybe, or what. Maybe it's just not supposed to matter. Uh, that's what I'm saying is I don't know whether there was supposed, yeah. supposed to be something to that or not, but I immediately recognized I went, okay, I'm pretty sure that's a man playing a woman or whatever. I don't care. I just don't know if, like I said, there's some kind of meaning to that. Cause then I'm like, Oh, is that supposed to be like the CD part of these rich people that are meeting with people behind closed doors? Cause they don't want it to get out in the public type of thing. Cause that kind of becomes what it is. The woman playing the piano, the one guy, Keep saying, no, nah, make her a brunette. So they change her hair color. And then she stands up and comes over. He's like, ah, I'd like her bigger on top. So they make her breasts bigger. So it's basically magical prostitutes that you can customize to what you want. And that's what the, what Vivian is. She's the brothel owner. And so then um, Harry gets knocked out again because uh, they knock him out and... <laughs> They could catch him. Oh, and when they wake him up, uh, then uh, Julian Sands was there again. And he's basically like, what are you doing here? I thought you were working for 
uh, Gottlieb. And he's like, well, yeah, I was working for him, but I'm also working for the brothel owner because I can do more than one things at a time. And he says, okay, I, do you know anything about the beach house? And Sans is like, I don't know what beach house are you talking about? And he figures out from the way he answers, he's like, okay, you do know what the beach house is. You're probably the one who wiped it. That's probably the place where they send the clients with the prostitutes from here. But why? And Sans is like, ah, you don't need to know that. And he's like, get out of here before, you know, something worse happens to you. And they basically throw him out. So Lovecraft goes and he goes to find uh, Pam. And Pam is at a drive-in movie watching a movie with herself in it. And (laughs) because she says she likes to like see her acting or something. So he's like, well, here's what I've found. And I think you know more about this because you kept trying to warn me off that house. And that house is connected to where whatever happened that involved Gottlieb went on that was wiped. So you must know something. At which point a woman shows up, a random woman shows up and starts talking to Pam. And, you know, clearly they know each other. And Lovecraft's like, well, who's that? And she's like, it's a friend of mine. Don't worry about it. And then in the movie at that point, a guy fires a gun at the at the screen. And now the bullets start coming out. So now they got to get out of the car and they're running. And the woman whose name is Marie grabs Pam's car, steals it and drives off. And Lovecraft takes Pam, since she doesn't have a car now, drives her back to the office. And Lovecraft is like, well, I'm going to call the cops because I'm going to report a stolen car. Maybe they can bring this woman in and question her. And Pam stops him and like hangs the car up. And then she's, he's asking her all these questions like, okay, you know something, you're hiding something. And so then she starts to try to turn on the seduction beam. She's like, well, you know, we could, we could discuss this or we could have a drink. And he's like, yeah, no. He's like, I don't get involved with people when there's too many questions floating around him. So you can shut that shit down right now. And right after he says that the phone rings, he picks it up and it's the cops. And the cops are like, Hey, uh, you better come down to the dock. There's something here. You might be interested in. He goes down. And the same cops are there from Gottlieb's office and they're fishing the the car out of the water. And in the water is that woman, but she's been turned into a mannequin. And so the cops like this car belongs to your client. You wouldn't happen to know where she is. And he's like, "Uh, I don't know. I, I, you know, she hired me to clear her name, but um, you know, I I can't divulge that information. The cops like, man, you better be careful with this one. You know, the classic, she's going to, she's going to drag into her own business, right? Like, don't, don't let your guard down with this one. She's these beautiful women. They're the most dangerous type of thing, right? (laughs) So by the time Lovecraft comes back, it's now the morning and Pam is long gone. And the, the witch is there and, and she gave the witch a note and the witch gives him the note. And it basically, it just says like, sorry. And that's about it. And And she's just gone. And so the witch says, uh, the witch says, you know, I can see that that raven and the snake are both on you. And he's like, how'd you know about the snake? I didn't tell you about the snake. And she's like, I can see things, man. And that snake belongs to you somehow. And he's like, all right. And right before they're about to get into what that means, um, some guys bust in and serve the witch with a summons to appear at a Senate hearing. And so, and then uh, Lovecraft is there and he's like, well, what's all this about? And he's like, oh, you're Lovecraft, right? And he's like, yeah, I'm Lovecraft. And he's like, well, the senator wants to meet you, so come with us. So he goes and he goes to a rally that's being held by the senator, which is basically a big amphitheater. And there's a big banner that says, like, no more magic in Hollywood. And then in the middle, there's a stake, like, to burn a witch at. And so then we get this nice little bit of exposition. So here we go. Larson Crockett, pleased to meet you. Phil Lovecraft. Heard a lot about you, Phil. Heard a considerable lot about you. Hope you don't mind meeting out here. Got a lot to do in precious little time. Our support grows bigger every day. That's a little premature, isn't it? The stake? You might say it's symbolic. Nice centerpiece for the rally. Of course, now that Congress has passed the capital punishment bill, well, then it could be something else, couldn't it? Why did you subpoena Kropotkin? I take it you know she's a card-carrying witch. Having an office across from her, you probably see things, hear things, smell things. I'm smelling something right now. I thought you were the man who didn't believe in magic. Oh, I believe in it. I just don't use it. Oh, it's a gift from a friend. Friends are a valuable commodity, Phil, but you gotta be careful. Don't let people get too close, things rub off. Man has to be very careful of the company he keeps. You must get very lonely. 
Would you give a loaded gun to a child, Lovecraft? Would you let a baby play with a blowtorch? Of course you wouldn't. I love the people of this country. I love them enough to protect them from sinister forces out to exploit their appetites. I want you to join my personal staff. Come on board as a full-time paid investigator. Together we can bring about an end to this plague. Well, I appreciate your offer, but I got clients. The Gottlieb killing? There are better uses for your talents. How many times did you and Gottlieb meet? Just once. He came by my hotel. He wanted to talk in private, so we drove around for a few hours. He told me many disturbing things about the influence of magic in the motion picture business. I tried to get him to testify for my committee, but he was too afraid. Not unjustifiably, as it turned out. Well, that's too bad. Yes, Gottlieb would have made a very powerful witness. But under the circumstances, his wife will be just as effective. As Gottlieb's widow, she felt it was her duty to uncover the forces of magic corrupting the movies. She's testifying tomorrow morning, just before your friend, Kropotkin. Okay, so this sets up the next scene. So we cut to that, which is the Senate hearing. And in the Senate hearing, we see that Pam is testifying. And up until now, anytime she was talking about Gottlieb, she didn't care. She was disgusted, blah, blah, blah. You know, didn't give a shit because, you know, he was having sex with this other actress. So she was, you know, didn't care. So in the hearing, though, she's very distraught. And, and talking about how it was so terrible that he was murdered by magic. And, you know, he was a good man who was brought low by the magic corrupting. So basically she's playing along with what Crockett wants the narrative to be, right? And so everything is going along and, you know, he's asking her questions that she's clearly ready for and acting the right way because, of course, she's an actress. And then there was a watch chain that we saw Gottlieb every time we'd see the character, the producer. He'd be playing with this little watch chain thing. And so Crockett, the senator, he pulls out this watch chain. He says, hey, do you know who happened to give him this chain? And you can see that she wasn't expecting this. This was a surprise. So she doesn't really want to answer. And he keeps pressing her and he says, you are under oath. You have to answer. And so she finally says, I, be- I-, I was told that the witch, I believe the witch gave it to him. And he says, thank you very much. And of course, this is now becoming a setup for the witch. So they dismiss her and they bring her to the stand. And they basically have her confirm she gave him the watch. And Crockett's like, well, it's interesting because he was killed very shortly after he got this watch chain from you. And for all we know, you cursed it or you did something to it or whatever. And she's saying, I didn't do anything like that. It was a good luck charm. And he's like, well, I don't know. I mean, it seems suspicious to me. But, you know, if you're willing to name the coven that you belong to, if you would name the names of the people that are in your coven, then maybe we can talk. And she's like, I'm not going to name anything. And he's like, well, then I have to I have to figure that if you won't recant your magic beliefs and you won't name your coven, and then this was you acting in a lone wolf type of thing and we're going to have to sentence you to death under the new Manti Magic Act and so they sentence her to burn at the stake that's why the stake was there so she's dragged out of the courtroom and so Lovecraft had warned Pam to get out because she said I didn't know they were going to do this he's like get out of here and there were some other people from the coven he's like get out before they figure out that you're part of this and so he gets him out of the room so he goes and he finds uh, Pam holed up in a hotel and he says, look, uh, you know, I don't think you knew that they were going to set the witch up. And she's like, I didn't. That was not part of the plan. I was supposed to get immunity if I testified that uh, magic was bad so that it would advance what he wants to do. But they didn't say anything to me about burning a witch. Nothing of this. I didn't know anything about the watch. No, nothing. And he's like, well, now that's happening. So you're going to have to tell me what's going on here. And so we get this expl- or no wait, I'm sorry. Wait, do we get the explanation? Yeah, I think this is the explanation. I think this clip is or maybe not. No, I think this is never mind. That's not that. Sorry. So <laughs> well, basically what she explains is cuz he says, "I know you knew the woman who got killed, and I know you know something about that beach house because you kept telling me not to go there. What happened?" And she says that basically the brothel owner runs a scam on rich or influential people where they they take that woman who got killed. She's always the prostitute that goes with them. She gets modified into whatever they want. And then she makes them get into rough sex so that she can fake getting killed. And then when she fakes getting killed in a panic, they call the brothel owner. She shows up, says, well, I can clean it up, but now you owe me. And then she has these people in their pocket, right? 
And so she says, okay, or Lovecraft says to her, okay, but why are you going along with this? And Pam says, well, because the brothel owner, Vivian, she, she helped me with something. He says, what? And she's, and he says, and she takes off her necklace that she's worn. She don't even notice. They don't really make a big deal of it, but she has a necklace on. She takes it off, at which point she suddenly becomes normal looking. And what I really like about this particular thing that they do is I'm 99% sure that all they did was have Penelope Ann Miller without makeup. It's her. They don't change the actress. And all it is is all the makeup and everything goes away and she's just there. And it's because she's talking and everything without it. And I think it's just her without makeup, which is fucking ballsy, number one, because you do see how much different somebody looks, which we knew, but it's very clearly shown because then she puts the necklace back on and all the makeup comes back and she becomes like she is in the rest of the movie, which is very made up. But I love the fact that I'm pretty sure it's just her without makeup. That's a, that's a pretty simple trick, though. Think about it. Like That, I, that doesn't I cost agree. them anything. <laughs> it doesn't, but I don't know that a lot of actresses would even do it. You know, because of course we know they don't look like that all the time, but you don't normally see it like that. Mm-hmm. So anyway, she puts the the uh, the thing back on, and uh, after telling about the scam and everything like that, and then uh, you get this line where Lovecraft says that he sees water everywhere. He's like water, water everywhere, and then he explains why he doesn't use magic, and that's this bit. I just wanted to be happy. I ain't got pills for that now. Water. Water everywhere. You don't know everything. You don't have the magic in your blood. You don't have it on your skin every day of your life. No. But I used it once. A long time ago. Just once. There were two men. They're going out on a boat, and I needed to hear what they said. So I hid an empty bottle on board. And when they came back, um, I took the bottle and I poured the conversation out and I had what I needed. But they weren't alone on the boat. There was a girl. So when the cops came after him, they figured the girl had ratted. Cops got them both, but before they did, one of them had time to take her back out on that boat, strangle her, and threw her body into the bay. And now, the man in the bottle has come back. So, of course, if you're paying any attention at all, you know who the guy in the bottle was, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. So we know where this is going. So... Lovecraft leaves now that he knows what's going on. He goes back to the the brothel and he finds the owner who's getting ready to leave town. And he says, where is uh, Julian Sands? He's like, where I'm going to call him Warlock because that's everybody knows about. So where's Warlock? <laughs> so he says, where's Warlock? And, you know, she doesn't want to tell him. And he's like, look, uh, I know why you're running. I understand he's dangerous. I want to take care of him as much as you want him taken care of. Just tell me. Which what is, is funny because because the Julian Sands character is a lot like the. The, the little guy all dressed in white in, uh, in was it something? Uh, the, the... Uh, yeah, in the Cast Deadly Spell. Yeah, I, he's very, they, they, they took a similar character. Yes, they, uh, that's what I'm saying, is this is all the same basic ingredients, but a different movie. So the, the brothel owner says he's at the rally, and he's like, the rally? He's like, why would he go there? They hate magic there. He's like, all right, I'll go there. So he goes, and he sees the rally, and it's a bunch of people that are, you know, the stake's on fire, and they're like, yeah, burn the witch, burn the witch. You know, typical what you would expect of a, a nutso rally type of thing. So then we see in the, in behind the stage, down the stairs, we see Julie, or Warlock, we see Warlock and the senator, and Warlock is being handed a case full of money by the senator. And so Lovecraft comes down, and then we kind of get the big reveal on what's going on, which is this. Evening, Lovecraft. Glad you could make it. How much is in there? Oh, not so much in the grand scheme of things. Expediting pays pretty good. So does discretion. You had Gottlieb killed. You thought he was the one working the Badger game. I'm afraid I went off a little half-cocked. And the girl. Loose ends, Finn. You know how I am about loose ends. <laughs> and uh, whose idea was it to uh, set up Kropotkin? Mine. The senator wanted to use Kim, but I convinced him that the frame would be a better fit using 
the witch. Kim is Penelope so, Ann Miller. This guy's gonna blackmail you. And now you're acting like long lost brothers. Politics makes strange bedfellows, I guess. But he's a practitioner. So? It was all a show. The hearings, the press coverage, attacking magic. You could care less about protecting the people. Spend some time in Congress, Phil. You get up to here with the people. <laughs> Listening to their petty complaints, their demands, their constant inane whining about one thing after the next thing after the next thing after the next thing. Just because they vote for you, they think you owe them something. But why go after magic? Who am I supposed to go after? Big business? You need something <laughs> a little different, a little outside. <laughs> Let me tell you something about the people, Phil. You lock any ten of them in a room, they may not elect a leader, but I guarantee they'll pick someone to hate. Right, so now we have the whole idea, you know, the whole reveal of what's going on. So Crockett, basically, the senator calls in people who take not only Lovecraft prisoner, but also Warlock. And Warlock gets very pissed off and spits on the senator. And when he spits on him, it becomes like a lizard that kind of like crawls into his clothes and disappears. So, of course, we know that means something. The senator doesn't seem to really notice it, knows he spit on him, but doesn't see what happens. And Lovecraft, of course, immediately realizes something's going on. So they drag them out to watch the burning of the witch. And again, this is something where this this is deliberate. But I don't, they didn't really, I don't, I, I think this is supposed to be a subtle thing that you're supposed to notice if you're paying attention. The witch, who up till now has been dressed like a, you know, a woman in the 50s with a very nice kind of dress suit and, you know, made up and has a hat on and has like straightened hair that's back in a bun. But when they take her out of the prisoner van, she's dressed in what looks like tribal clothing and she's got her natural hair and she's not made up. Which I'm like, that's interesting because she looks very different. This is almost like now we're doing a racial thing, too. It just the appearance is so different yeah. that, you know, it's obviously not accidental. Yeah. But again, the movie doesn't really, I guess, unless, it just the, unless you to notice they it. unless they specifically dressed her up so that the crowd could see burn well, that, exactly what they wanted. That could be. That's very yeah. possible. That's what I'm saying is it's she looks so different that you you notice it. But I don't know that most people would really really notice it but anyway they take her out and they get ready to burn her at which point the senator starts making a speech and then he starts having some kind of convulsion he spits up a giant frog and lovecraft says okay what'd you do to him and warlock says well hey man you know nobody double crosses me at which point the senator kind of collapses and his back rips open and out of his back he emerges a second him but this one looks like lou reed Long hair, all in black, starts berating the crowd, calling them assholes and hypocrites, and you just want to see somebody burn. And then the other senator, the fake senator, he's also there. So now there's two of them, but it's his evil self has been revealed, which I didn't. At first, I thought the old one died, and this one was his like inner self coming out. But no, there's actually two of them now. And the, the, the Lou Reed one is ranting and raving and the other one's trying to convince people that it's not him. And everybody's like, wait, you're using magic too. And so they both get arrested for some reason. They get dragged off. Lovecraft frees the, the witch. Uh, Warlock makes his escape. And of course, we now know Lovecraft tells the witch, well, the witch is uh, the one who killed the girl, right? Because I used magic, whatever. So he goes to find him. And when he catches up to Warlock, Warlock's like, look, uh, he's, he's got, he's at the beach house and he comes in and he's like, I want you to join my organization. He's like, I know you're a better magic user than you think you are. And you've just sworn it off, which is stupid. Join me and we can be a powerful, you know, it's like the emperor Join me, you know, the whole thing. So, and of course, Lovecraft says no. And Warlock's well says, well, then I'm going to summon, I can, I'm going to reverse time. And instead of Gottlieb being rough with the character who was faking it for the scam i'm going to replace her with pam and have her die for real and the only way you can stop me is if you use magic so of course he starts to you know they, he reverses time you see the senators there he's drowning um pamela or penelope ann miller and lovecraft starts to hold up because earlier 
you keep seeing that he's wearing this bracelet. So he holds up his arm and the bracelet starts to spin, at which point it cuts to outside. You see the witch like make a, I don't know, witch gesture or whatever. And the Lovecraft kind of opens his mouth and a raven flies out of it, rips Julian Sand's evil eye out. I didn't mention he has an evil eye. It's like different colored. Rips his evil eye out. At which point Julian Sands starts screaming, stumbles outside of the house, and this is a beach house, so they're over the water. Lovecraft comes outside and kicks him into the water, and for some reason he drowns. I guess he can't swim and dies. And then Lovecraft kind of goes out. He goes outside. He rescues Pam. She doesn't drown. Goes outside, and the witch is like, I couldn't let you use magic. I know why you didn't use it, so I used it for you. I used the raven. It was there anyway, so why not just use it, and that way you don't have to actually use magic, and you can, you know, not have to use it. So then we cut to train station and Pam is there and she's taking the necklace off. So she's just now her normal self. And she says, you know what? I've, uh, I've figured out that Hollywood is it for me. I'm going to go get a new start somewhere else. She says, I never used my real name in this town so I can use my real name somewhere else and no one will ever know me. And Lovecraft kisses her and she goes off. And then we cut to him on the roof and we get our little bit of ending narration, which is this. Kim Hudson disappeared. But since she never really existed, I figured the score was even. It didn't matter anyway. Pretty soon another girl would be stepping off the Highland bus, wishing herself into a D cup and her big break. Crockett, too. He's the kind of guy who says he hates magic and then goes home and levitates chicks in the basement. Last I heard, he was sharing a cell with himself in San Quentin. And so it goes. There was usually a one-to-one ratio between dreams and disappointments, and no amount of magic could change that. It's always going to be there if someone wants to believe in it. Let's face it, everybody's got to believe in something. And the movie ends and we get credits, and that's the movie. So it, it is what, the, what you read. It's a redoing it's of Cast of the so Spell. interesting that they felt the need to do that, though. Yeah, I, I don't know. I because this is from when HBO was a completely different thing, when it was its own channel and it was trying to make its own stuff. And so it's from a different time when this thing kind of thing happened. So I don't know why either, because I agree. I, I don't maybe maybe they they own the property. So they were like, well, let's just do it again. That's with possible. Dennis Hopper. Yeah, I, I guess it could be because it, it's not necessary but at the same time, it's not a bad movie. It's a very fun movie. It's a very watchable movie. It is different enough from Cast a Deadly Spell that I don't care. Yeah. Because it, it isn't, it isn't, no, it I, didn't I, just replicate I it. I totally see that. It sounds different. The description is different. The way that the main character handles himself is different. Like, I, I can accept that it's it's almost like Ghost, the Ghost in the Shells. It's like you have the yeah, Ghost in the yeah, Shell yeah, yeah. show and the Ghost in the Shell movie. They're yeah. both good, but they're independent of each other. Right, right. And yeah, it's like, no, this is kind of like that. It's like an alternate universe version of the same movie. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, that's yeah. interesting. I might have to watch that because now I'm, I love the, the the other version, the Fred Ward one. Um, well, that's the thing is there's not a lot of movies like this. So that's the other reason where I'm like, I, I really don't care because there aren't a lot of magic noir films. We don't get them very often. So I'll take whatever no, and, ones I can get, you know? No, and honestly, that's one of the things I loved about the Keanu Reeves Constantine, which is that it was eventually, it was essentially trying really hard to be that kind of like yeah, yeah, supernatural yeah. noir. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I know that it, I know that it wasn't Constantine from the comics, but I still really enjoy it. No, but it's still a good movie. Yeah, it's still yeah. a good movie. Yeah. So, like I said, I, I liked it. it it's. If you just don't go in expecting it to be, again, number one, it's not a sequel, which people just can't seem to wrap their heads around. I keep seeing people saying it's a sequel. It's not a sequel. And as long as you're not going to make a quality comparison, because I don't, you know, I don't, number one, I don't think that's even fair. Well, let's see. It, is, it, is it better or worse? Than Cast Deadly Spell? Yeah. Oh, no, it's, it's, it's worse. That's why I was saying. Cast Deadly oh, Spell okay. is Predator, so had, and this okay. is Predator 2. So it... Too. So it it did have less of a budget in that respect. Yeah, I, I it felt like it had less of a budget. I think the humor worked better in Cast a Deadly Spell. Um, it, it, it's hard to quantify. Like, there's not a single thing about it, but it's you can. It is the difference between the two Predators, right? The first Predator clearly has a really good director in charge of it. It's got a great budget. It looks great. Like it's filmed so well. 
It's got the yeah. music. It's got everything. And then Predator 2, it never feels as real as Predator. You know what I mean? It's 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 clearly sets in many cases. They're not in the oh, jungle. Yeah. That it's that type of difference. It's not really whether one yeah. is even though bad even though they they have the disc of death and they have this and they have that. Yes. But yeah, it's yes. still it's still right. it's still a schlocky movie. Yeah, that's why I like Julian Sands. I like better in this than the 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 other guy because it's Julian Sands and he's good, right? So it's. There's things that, that I think work better, and there are things that overall I think work worse. So I, I don't know that you necessarily do a one-to-one comparison, but that's where I was saying, is if you were to tell somebody, you know, uh, well, which one should I watch first, Predator or Predator 2? I will always say Predator. Oh, Predator. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Well, that's this. If somebody said, yeah. well, which of these should I watch first? Watch Cast Deadly Spell. Then watch Witch Hunt. It's a different type of movie. It's yeah. not quite as tight in terms of its production, but it's still listen, fun. No, no, listen, listen. You watch Predator, and you watch it. Like, you sit and you watch it. It's a yeah. great movie. Then, a couple days later, have a few drinks and watch and Predator 2 with friends. Too. Yes, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> right. that's, that's, the two, that's what these two movies are. If you want you a know. comparison, that's it. Yeah. So, that, that's what I would say about it. Honestly, Perfectly no, really... Fun. Really, the way it should work is you should watch Predator, then you watch Aliens, then you watch Predator 2. Um, actually, no, I guess you watch Terminator, because you got to see Bill Paxton. Sure. In uh... <laughs> Paxtology. Yeah, the Paxtology. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, fun movie. So, I would say, yeah, you should watch it. You'd probably like it. But, again, yeah, I, I, you know, I, most of the reviews it's... keep comparing it to the other one. I'm like, ah... Yeah, of course. I, no, I vaguely remember this, and I remember thinking that it was a it was like a sequel. I remember and I was, it being and on I was too, wondering, but I never watched it. And I was wondering why they replaced Fred Ward with Dennis Hopper. Well, because they sort of I, didn't. I like Fred Ward more. <laughs> that, and that and that's what I'm saying is Danny Glover is great, but he's not Arnold Schwarzenegger. Oh, right? absolutely I mean, it, it's, not. No. This is it, not it's not even a, remotely. Yeah, and it, that is the best comparison I can give you for these two movies. Is there's no reason not to watch both, but you're going to understand that one has a better feels like a better made movie, and the other one feels yeah. like a HBO TV movie with that type of budget and that type of approach. So I don't know what the necessity was. Maybe it was just that somebody owned the rights. But I don't mind that it was redone this way. It's an interesting alternate way to do the story. It's not bad. It's not better. But it's different. And it's not terrible. So and I like Dennis Hopper. And he's I like him in this role. And I like Julian Sands. And even though, you know, he's more of a minor character, but he pops up throughout the movie. They, they knew enough to keep Julian Sands coming, unlike Debbie Mazar. They really fucked up there. But with Julian Sands, they knew enough to sprinkle him through it. Penelope Ann Miller is always solid. I like her. She's fun in this. She gets some great lines like, I got fucked in the producer's office, which that alone makes it worth watching. The thing where they put the guy in the lunchbox, stuff like that. Like, and Shakespeare. Oh, they show Shakespeare at the very end in the rally, and they're like, okay, we want to write a movie about this, so get to writing. And he's just like, oh, Jesus. And he's just right because it's just garbage writing for producers in Hollywood, which is, it's its own joke, which is fine. So there's stuff like that, and that's what makes it worth watching. But yeah, I, I wouldn't, I don't think it's fair to compare it, even though, yes, they're the same material. It's a different type of movie, but I thought it was good. So, yeah, you would probably have a good time with it. And I would tell people if you were put off by reviews that say it's a shitty sequel. No, number one, it's not a sequel. And number two, it's not yeah, shitty. It's just the different. fact the fact that it's not a sequel is what makes it really weird. Like, it's just. Oh, yeah. yeah. Its existence is. Strange. I mean, how, what what is the, the time frame years wise between them? Because it doesn't even feel like it's that, that long, is it? No, I think it was like three years, maybe. Cast Deadly Spell was from, I could be wrong about that. Let me look it up. The year is 91, three years later. Also, by the way, it shows it as an HBO movie, but the other one is described as an HBO TV movie. So I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. See and yeah. even and and here's a, here's something even stupider. Now on Cast and Deadly Spell, the trivia says that they, that HBO produced a sequel, but that's not true. And even in this, they say Dennis Hopper plays the Lovecraft character. Other characters that reappear from this film, but many have different backstories. Well, then it's not. What, what are you talking about? It's, it's not a sequel it's, anymore. It's not a sequel, <laughs> right? So that's what I'm saying. Is it, I, it's confusing. It doesn't make sense. The fact that, number one, it's confusing whether it's a sequel or not, which it's not, and that it doesn't make sense that they would reinterpret this so soon after it. It's not like it's 20 years later. So yeah, I agree. Exactly. It's, it makes no sense. 
But nonetheless, it exists. But man, I would totally, watch. I would totally take a sequel today. Oh sure, I, I'd love. To. I would, I would do a mini series. I love, uh, I love the world that they created for that. Oh yeah, I mean, well, this is like you know, like it's like Kolchak. I mean, it's the same idea. It's do Kolchak yeah, with yeah, magic. Yeah, yeah, except except magic is everywhere. Right. So it is. So just why what not? It is. That yeah. would be really fun. The by the way, the movie in its entirety is up right now, and at least two YouTube channels full. <laughs> so you, you can go, go watch. Uh, sorry, there's three. There's a third one. But I see two of them, and let me just click on one and just make sure it's not a bait and switch thing. Uh, no, no, it's no, it's it's there. It's not as great a quality as I watched it because I watched it on Amazon. I want to say I don't remember now, but whatever streaming service I watched it on, it was it was good quality. So it's not as good a quality, but you know what? Watch this first and then decide whether you want to go find it or whatever anywhere else. Was it on Amazon? I don't remember now. Anyway, wherever you can see it for free. So anybody who's curious. You can go watch it for free. Um, let me see. Does it say? Oh, God, IMDb is so fucking bad now. <laughs> garbage site. So, sorry. I don't remember where I watched it. But you can watch it on YouTube. And it's not the worst quality in the world. So, on that note, uh, whether you choose to... Pers- I mean, if you want to watch Star Trek in the Darkness, go for it. I'm not going to tell you not to. So you can watch it. If See, you're you, you and I differ. You say that, you know, sure. you, you think it should be kept off the list. I definitely think you should watch it at least once. Well, there you go. So, but I can... say that, but I say that saying it's not a good movie, but there's cool stuff in there to take with you. Well, I will say the same about Liquid Sky, which is probably not going to be on many people's list, but it's certainly on mine. So in that way, <laughs> I understand what you're saying and I concur. So. Star Trek in the Darkness and Liquid Sky are almost a good double feature in that I don't know how many oh, people will want to rewatch what? those. If if uh, if Cumberbitch had shown up on screen and had done like a beatbox, a beatbox? version of Khan. Well, then it would be a classic. <laughs> then it would be a classic. I agree. No, that, that, would, that would make me forgive all the other flaws. It truly would. Uh. So, so you have a wide array of things from this week's show to go out and experience in whatever fashion you'd like to. So have a wonderful weekend, and we will be back here to jabber about more weird shit next week. Visit OzoneNightmare.com to subscribe to new episodes, browse through our back catalog, or to find links to support the show. Follow at OzoneNightmare on Twitter for the latest episode postings and other show information. If 280 characters just isn't enough, you can always email us, theOzoneNightmare at gmail.com. The opening theme for the show is provided by Heartbeat Hero. The closing theme is provided by Ogre. Please visit and support these artists using the links in the show notes for each episode. 